This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. In 2006, one of the most peculiar grave sites in all of pre-classic Mesoamerican history was discovered in Mexico City. I know, Mexico City is quite a distance from the American Southwest and our history of the Chaco Anasazi, but stay with me. There are some parallels to our story here. This particular grave site, buried deep under Defe, has been dated to 2,400 years before present, or around 400 BC. Beneath the Pontifical University of Mexico, in the Tlalpan area of that very old city, the single largest number of skeletons found in a single burial from that pre classic period of Mesoamerican history was discovered. And in that burial, it appears around 10 individuals were arranged into the shape of a spiral. Because of the ages of the 10 dead, the site's leader, uh, Jimena Rivera Escamilla, told the website Noticieros Televisa, quote, We believe that it could be some interpretation of life, because individuals have different ages. There is a baby, a child, an infant, some young adults, adults, and an older adult, end quote. The bodies had their arms intertwined. Some of them were touching the other's back. And some of their hands were ceramic spheres, and around their heads were ceramic pots. What does this burial site mean? I have no idea. But neither did the people who excavated it. Well, I mean, besides saying it's probably ceremonial, as Escamilla suggested. As a matter of fact, the culture that buried these people under that, uh, what, well, the city, what would later become the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, the people that buried these ten skeletons, their culture is completely unknown as well. It wasn't the Olmec, certainly not, who had flourished around the Gulf of Mexico. It wasn't the Maya either. The Aztec were somewhere in Aztlan, maybe, or possibly still wandering and searching and migrating. The people that buried these ten individuals uh, into that sh spiral shape, their fate is ultimately unknown, much like the Anasazi's fate. At least the fate of a lot of the Anasazi. But like the Anasazi, they went somewhere. They didn't just disappear. I know I've talked a lot about the spiral. It's a key theme, much like migration. But it's a key theme in these episodes in this series over the people who inhabited the American Southwest. All the way back, all the way back to the Ice Age. Are spirals completely unique to the Anasazi? Absolutely not. Spirals are found with the massive seen from the air Nazca lines in Peru and South America. Spirals depict wind, water, the stars, movement, all sorts of things all over the Americas. It's a pretty prolific piece of iconography. Take, for instance, the Las Plazuelas ruins in Guanajuato, Mexico where most of the 1,400 petroglyphs at the massive site depict spirals. Spirals also inhabit the walls of rooms inside the large buildings, and those buildings are known as the casas tapadas, or covered houses. And that's because they're big houses with roofs. Uh, Las Plazuelas is around 215 miles due west, northwest, from Mexico City. Mexico City and that spiral burial. Las Plazuelas was built around 600 AD, which is a thousand years after those spiral burials. This site, uh, Las Plazuelas, contains quite a bit of turquoise. A ball court, an engineered straight road, and... I have sunken into the earth structure known as a Timascal, or a Mesoamerican sweat lodge. Not to be confused with a half sunken kiva. Who built the site? Uh, well, much like the question of who buried the ten spiral skeletons, researchers aren't sure. The going theory is that it was most likely a collection of cultures that inhabited the region, both near and far. And these cultures had come together to build something unique. 
maybe even to better interact with nearby, well, not so nearby, but the large center of Teotihuacan. Most of the groups at Las Plazuelas were probably nomadic, and they're known today as Chichimeca. Chichimeca is a Nahuatl word for barbarian. Barbarian as the Romans would have used it. But clearly, the people who built Las Plazuelas weren't barbarians. So an area where different hunter-gatherer groups, who also planted, but in an area where different hunter-gatherer groups decided to build some monumental architecture, including ball courts, a massive road, and big roofed houses, and where they etched over a thousand spirals into nearby boulders and onto the walls of those big houses. Here's a quote from the Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia, or INAH, of Mexico. Uh, the quote is by anthropologist Martha Ruth Ortega Rivera. Another distinctive feature of Plazuelas is the harmony of the architecture with its environment, as well as the urban layout and the complexity of the buildings. End quote. Elsewhere on the INAH website, she says Plazuelas was, quote, carefully built to preserve the harmony of its surroundings, end quote. That sounds a lot like sacred ceremonial landscape architecture. So, covered houses of intricate and complex design. I didn't say the words great in houses together. That was your mind. Sacred landscape architecture, covered houses, the ball court, the road, the spirals, Am I saying because these unidentified people who abandoned this settlement? Hmm, those are two things that should be familiar to my listeners with the Anasazi, an unknown group of people, and abandonment. But am I saying these unknown cultures that came together from differing parts of the nearby region and from possibly far away, but okay, am I saying these unknown cultures that came together from different parts of the region to build what sounds like, on paper at least, a very similar thing to, oh, I don't know, Chaco Canyon? Am I saying that these people are the same ones that built Chaco? Well, not the exact same ones. No, of course not. Don't be ridiculous. Sure, the site's abandoned a hundred years before Chaco really starts, but that is probably coincidental. The two groups being the same sounds crazy. That would be like suggesting a group of people built many of their largest settlements, great pueblos, a massive straight road, an entire region of fire towers, ceremonial buildings. Uh, they built all of that in a straight line, and they call it, it's called something like a, a, a Chaco Meridian. Plazuelas, though, is not anywhere near the Chaco Meridian. But, at a site on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, a place one degree off of the Chaco Meridian, just one degree, very far south, mind you, actually as far south as the line can take you, because that line hits the Pacific Ocean and you can't walk any further south than that, I'd like to see you try. But less than one degree at 106 degrees and 77 minutes, as opposed to 107 degrees and 57 minutes. And I cannot emphasize that enough, but at almost the exact same Chaco Meridian degree of longitude, near a city called Culiacan, at a site known as the Las Labradas Archaeological Zone, there sits on the sand, often beaten by waves and covered by the rising tides, but on that sand sits an extremely rare and amazing phenomenon in archaeology. On that Pacific sand sits a group of volcanic rocks, and on these volcanic rocks have been carved, for the last 4,500 years, at least 640 rock engravings. And these 640 engravings seem to follow a well-structured order. And among these well-structured and planned 640 petroglyphs, there were carved into the black volcanic stones that sit strikingly on the creamy beach sand that gets hit by waves, which smooth out the edges, and which often are covered by the tide. Among these 640 petroglyphs, many of them are, you guessed it, spirals. When I saw pictures of these spirals, 
I gasped. I showed my wife, and even her eyes widened at what she was seeing. She's been up close and personal with a giant white etched spiral on a steep red sandstone wall in the deserts of Utah. She knows what an Anasazi spiral looks like. She knows what it feels like to see them, to see into them. She's also seen the stylized animals on rocks the Anasazi have carved. She's seen both the spirals and the animals from Moab all the way to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And also on these rocks of the at the Las Labradas site are carved stylized humans and animals. She could see the similarity from the pictures on the internet as quickly as I could. We've both seen spirals on volcanic rocks even. But my wife's not seen even a fraction of what I have, both in studying and in the wild, uh, on the computer, in books, in magazines, in real life, with my own eyes. What I was seeing in the pictures of the Las Labradas volcanic black stones was remarkably familiar. Not identical, mind you, but something felt familiar. Information on Las Labradas is hard to come by, at least in English, and my Spanish is not great. So maybe I am absolutely wrong and crazy and really just beyond my depth here. But that's what science is all about, right? That's when people make discoveries. When they're out of their league and pushing the boundaries. Look at Stephen Lexon and his Chaco Meridian. Not that he was ever out of his league, but he certainly was pushing boundaries. And yeah, you definitely can't compare the two of us, Lexon and I. He's an accomplished writer, archaeologist, anthropologist, historian, and researcher who actually goes out in the field. I'm an armchair, something-using, book-reading, map-pouring-over, occasional traveler who gets as worked up as a golden retriever whenever he thinks he's onto something new and exciting. With this intro, I'm not suggesting the people of Las Labradas, a site abandoned in the 1200s, hmm, but I'm not saying the people of Las Labradas and the people of Las Plazuelas and the people who buried the tin skeletons under Tenochtitlan in Mexico City. I'm not saying all of these people and the Anasazi of Chaco Aztec. I'm not saying they're all the same. I'm not suggesting that. Again, migration, migration, migration. People in the Americas moved constantly. It was literally in their blood, their DNA, since way back with the Clovis, but even before that, because they came across the sea or the strait, but they came across vast distances and entire continents, and they did all that immediately after leaving Africa, and they didn't stop. They went all the way down to South America immediately, but It only takes a few faithful evangelical individuals to go from one place to the next with neat enough ideas that can take off in each new area, and then for that neat idea to spread and grow and grow until, boom, you've got spirals and chaco and little chacos and T-shaped doors and macaws and copper bells and turquoise. You've got it just everywhere. In a totally unexpected and humbling and freaking awesome turn of events, I emailed Dr. Steve Lexon. I emailed him with a brief question about Las Labradas and if he'd ever heard of it because it's so close to the Chaco Meridian and it seems like maybe something could be connected there. To my joy and surprise, he responded. I was so excited. I called my wife immediately and giddily told her before I composed myself and responded back to the great and powerful archaeologist. He said he'd never heard of Las Labradas, but that it looked pretty spectacular. Although, despite my imagination running away from me, again, golden retriever finding a ball, but despite my initial thoughts, Lexon didn't really see anything in the pictures that reminded him of the Southwest. Except, of course, 
for the spiral. But as he put it in the email, the spiral's pretty universal. And of course, he's correct. And I wrote the opening of this episode uh, talking about the ubiquity of the spiral before his response. Because, I mean, the spiral really is everywhere in the Americas. But science and history, it's all about educated and sometimes not so educated guesses and theories. And being wrong is part of the fun. If you can't tell already, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is more or less conjecture and theory and guesses. Educated guesses. Educated guesses about people smarter than me, but guesses nonetheless. I have my own theories, which I'm not qualified to entertain, but I obviously am going to anyways. I interjected some of them last episode, and I will in this one, but in this one I really do go off the published and researcher-backed rails. But thankfully, I am neither published nor a backed researcher. That being said, I may get some stuff wrong, but definitely nothing major, hopefully. I mean, I am probably wrong about Las Labradas being remarkably close to Anasazi, and it being on the Chaka Meridian, as Lexan hinted to me in his response. But if some of the stuff I have and will discuss and hypothesize and guess it, if some of it turns out to be wrong, don't judge my whole podcast or even this whole episode. But especially don't judge me. I'm just guessing after all. And if you are learned in this field and you know something I do not, or if I have said something uh, that is totally wrong and not wrong in a you don't like what I said way, but wrong is in, hey, what you said is factually incorrect because this data says otherwise, then please hit me up. Not only do I need to hear that, but I will totally cite you in a correction later. That's a Southern gentleman's promise. And I have done corrections. If you'll recall my clarification of the Saruti Macedon site, most likely not, in fact, being a site from people that came to the West Coast some 130,000 years ago, but I offered my opinion on that correction. There's actually a great story in author David Roberts' The Lost World of the Old Ones. Uh, where he talk, where he's talking to a colorful old timer, uh, old time rancher who knew his land extensively and had grown up on it, and his family had grown up on it before him. This land is in Utah, and he gave it up to the state, which just always a terrible idea. Don't give anything to the state or the feds, please. But he gave this land to the state or a museum or a university. I can't remember. Actually talked about him briefly in the last episode when I discussed the rancher, the same one, who found all the bodies with arrowheads still in situ around them. Well, this man, who's named Waldo, if you'll remember, but Waldo explains to some archaeologists that are on his land, or what used to be his land, and they're there to conduct the the much-hyped studies and digs and what have you. But he's talking to the head guy, who is an archaeologist named Metcalf, um, well, Waldo, the longtime owner who'd seen more ruins and skeletons and artifacts than most entire archaeology departments will in a lifetime, and all of which had been lying where they were placed or fallen on his land for a thousand years, give or take. Waldo explained his theory of who the ancient ones were that inhabited his old land. His theory is rather outlandish, but who knows? It's a fun story. And I think Waldo knew that it was a fun story when he told these researchers, because he made it up, but when he told these researchers and professors and university archaeologists and students, when he told all these people that were now vacuuming up every artifact in the land and destroying the essence of, of the finds and all the sites, he knew the story he was telling them all he knew it was a fanciful story, and he most likely told it with a wink. But author David Roberts, after the old-timer Waldo had told his story, David Roberts witnessed the head archaeologist Metcalf dismiss Waldo's theory in an offhanded way, and Roberts had this to say. Waldo perceived the dismissal. Later he told me, quote, I may not know what I'm talking about, but hell, 
Them archaeologists don't know either. They're just guessing. Me? Thomas Wayne Riley? I'm just guessing too. And I'm having a great time doing it. So strap on your sandals and let's follow the Anasazi on their spiral migration. A startling change darted through the American Southwest from the South at around A.D. 400. We already know this because I talked about it in the Archaic episode. But not only beans and the bow and arrow flourished as they poured up from the South, but even chocolate was being consumed as far north as southern Utah by about A.D. 800, which is hundreds of years before it's been suggested it was being consumed at Chaco, and southern Utah is further north than Chaco. Archaeologist Dorothy Washburn at the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, uh, she studied this evidence of chocolate and the strange non anasazi bowls they were being stored and consumed in, and she came to a conclusion that backs the somewhat controversial view that I've been telling y'all for a while now. She said, quote, We're arguing that people were moving from Mesoamerican areas up north into the southwest. It was not just traders in isolated instances of trade. End quote. In the article for Western Digs, she later tells the author, quote, The bigger picture is you can't understand what's happening in the American southwest without understanding what's happening in the areas to the south. End quote. Just prior to that influx of southern migrants with their chocolate and with their weird shaped yellow and red thin walled ceramic vessels, which they serve the chocolate in. But before the influx of chocolate came across that uh, tortilla curtain, we know that the crops and the technology and cultural characteristics. And that all important architectural feature we've discussed so heavily. Craig Childs, a favorite author of mine, he says of this cultural migration that, quote, along with this push came Kiva-style pit houses on the Colorado Plateau and the first noteworthy gatherings of people in architecture at Chaco Canyon. People who had been relatively isolated in the Southwest were suddenly connected with a much larger civilization far to the South. Just as suddenly and at the same time, Amaranth, a grain native to the southwest, first appeared in the Tihuacan Valley of southern Mexico. Turquoise mined in New Mexico showed up in Guatemala. A reciprocal flow had begun. End quote. By 1300, the year of the Great Divide, and the year of the Great Migration out of the Four Corners and the Colorado Plateau, when the Anasazi abandoned their great houses, and their Pueblo cities and their cliff dwellings. By the year 1300, that reciprocal flow was only flowing one way, southward. The Anasazi Civil War seems to have been decided, and two, or I guess really uh, three, things followed. The first, which is broken up into two actions, is that a large, so the first, is that a large number of people whom we will henceforth call the Ancestral Puebloans, because for real, they're the ancestors of the modern Pueblo peoples. But the Ancestral Puebloans will leave the Chaco and Heartland Four Corners area and head to the modern Pueblo spheres and spaces and geographies. That group itself will split up with a portion of them heading to the Rio Grande near Santa Fe and Taos, 
and the Hamas Mountains, and another group going south to the Zuni Mountains and to the Akuma and even the Hopi Pueblos. These ancestral Puebloans will almost immediately start leaving behind for future archaeologists, but they'll immediately start leaving behind evidence of their new, uh, or maybe not new, but suppressed, suppressed during and throughout the Chaco Aztec Anasazi period by those Southerners and their religion. You know, that, uh, that team, the other team during the Civil War. But these ancestral Puebloans will begin, or, or begin again, we'll, we'll discuss it next time, but they'll, they'll start to practice the Kachina culture, which they are so very well known for today, and which Pueblo mystique dictates you remember them by. So, one side becomes the ancestral Puebloans, and they begin to practice their Kachina culture and build Pueblos on the Mesa edges throughout Arizona and New Mexico that they still reside in today. And the other group goes south. I'm still going to refer to this other group that goes south, uh, this group who was probably from the south, at least at one time, or were spiritually linked to the south. But this group that were now returning to the south on their Chaco Meridian, I'm going to refer to this group of ancient ones as Anasazi. Although, other names that archaeologists have given them, like the Salado culture, will come up a lot. But I believe they're the same group of people that left Chaco, uh, the, the Salado, I mean. I believe the Salado are the same group as the ones that left Chaco. And so I'm going to call them the Anasazi. I'm actually going to call them a lot of names. And I try to clarify exactly who I'm talking about um, when I call them each individual new name. The Anasazi's for real ultimate fate, as in where they were when the Spanish arrived, the Anasazi or Salado or what have you, what happened to them and who their descendants are today, those questions are completely unanswered. It is a for real mystery where they ultimately ended up. There are some theories, and some rather good ones, as we will discuss later. Those theories state that they could have returned to space in their pyramid ships, or whatever. We know how I feel about that garbage. They could have continued on down south, on the Chaco Meridian, even deeper into Mexico. Or they could have become the ancestors to a group of people famous for their ability to run vast distances at high altitudes and in tough weather, and in any difficult geography. Which sounds like the Anasazi we have come to know, right? Those great walkers who had decorated footprint sandals and who painted feet and six toes all over the boulders and walls of the Four Corners Colorado Plateau? Maybe it's a combination of all of these theories. Except, of course, for going back home to outer space. No, Elvis is not dead. He just went home. Okay, Kay. Well, I'm getting way, way, way ahead of myself here. Long before the Spanish ride about armies of tens of thousands in the Sierra Madre Mountains on the Chaco Meridian in Mexico, the Anasazi leapt up and were leaving the four corners. They were following the spiral southward on a defined course that will put them into contact with the Anasazi neighbors we've talked about before, like the Mogollon and the Hohokam. Their destination, at least at first, is a place known as Pakime. Before we talk about the interactions on their journey southward and how they help end those quite old systems of... Hohokam and Mogoyom. Before we talk about all that, we should introduce and talk a little about Pakime. Because honestly, even before the Great Divide and Migration of 1300, Pakime was growing and its material culture was changing with what can only be recognized as influences from Chaco. Not only the pottery, but T shaped doorways abound at Pakime and the surrounding mountains, honestly. And those T-shaped doors are even found further south 
into the imposing and quite grand Sierra Madres. But, Pacume. Pacume sits on the northeastern tip of those Sierra Madre mountains of Mexico in the Chihuahua Desert. If you turn modern geopolitical boundaries off in your Maps app, and if you switch it to satellite mode, and you then plot the place spelled P-A-Q-U-I-M-E, you'll see it is in a place that looks a whole lot like the rest of the American Southwest, uh, at least on the satellite image. The Chihuahua Desert is not all that different from the Sonoran Desert or Colorado Plateau, except it actually receives even more rain in the summer monsoons. The summers are still super hot, though, And the winters are still very cold. Uh, Actually, they're even colder in the Chihuahua Desert than up north. The Anasazi weren't moving to a completely alien landscape. Even the mountains, at least pictures of them, even the mountains of the Sierra Madres don't differ all that much in appearance from the canyons of the Four Corners. Uh, To me, especially, Cedar Mesa. Not to mention, Pacume is straight south down the line from Aztec, Chaco, and many other settlements like Shibikashi as it sits perfectly on the 107 degree Chaco Meridian. Archaeologist Steve and Lexon's Chaco Meridian theory to me is not really even a theory, uh, but should be considered a fact at this point. His genuine theories, which will probably bear out like all of his previous ones, uh, but his genuine theories like where the Anasazi went after the Spanish, those and other theories we will talk about at the end. But Pacime is a growing Anasazi center in northern modern day Mexico, even before the northern Anasazi show up. Well, before they show up in great numbers, uh, because the two populations were probably incredibly linked. On a side note, Mexico is a Nahual word, which means a place in the center of either the moon or an agave plant. Uh, No one's sure. But the Anasazi most likely spoke an Udo-Aztecan language, probably like the Hopi do today. Uh, The Anasazi spoke multiple languages, honestly, but the main one was probably Udo-Aztecan. The Hopi language is actually pretty close to Nahuatl, which the Aztecs spoke, so the Anasazi may have called Mexico, Mexico. Well, they could have, but they probably didn't. The Aztecs called Mexico Anahuac, which means land surrounded by water. Which, I mean, if they mean Mexico City, then I guess because it was on an island. But uh, I can't argue with the Aztecs, really. But the Hopi people, who also speak an Uto-Aztecan language, they've got a a pretty... Well, their ancestors are the ones that stayed behind. And they've got a pretty... Strong case to be made that they are descended from the Anasazi. So, these Anasazi, though, that, that were traveling, they were heading back towards their once long ago ancestral, or at least spiritual, homeland, and current sister capital, Pakime. And Pakime was closer to their Aztec cousins, while keeping on that Chaco Meridian line. So, Pakime. Those signal hills with the fires or maybe mirrors on top of them, and I say mirrors because the Mesoamerican Southerners at the time, at this time, 1300s, were indeed using mirrors. But not just in Mesoamerica. 36 mirrors with Mesoamerican designs have been found in sites at the Hohokam. But these fire signal hills that are still being pondered over and excavated today, because they're still kind of a fairly recent discovery, But those fire signal hills that connected the Chacoan world of the Four Corners is found at Pacume. It's a safe assumption, according to Dr. Stephen Lexon, a favorite archaeologist, historian, and writer of mine, who I discussed in the intro. Uh, But Dr. Stephen Lexon suggests it's a safe bet that those fire signal hills found at Pacume reached all the way to Chaco even before 1300. They actually stretch all the way to Chimney Rock in Colorado, and to the Bears Ears out west in Utah. Probably all the way over to modern-day Flagstaff, or at least the Sinagua sites around them that we'll talk about. Pacume was 
actually analogous and a contemporary to Chaco and Aztec up in New Mexico, 400 miles north. While those great houses were becoming greater and the Chaco and Alta pedal was growing in influence, uh, while the things that were happening, which I discussed in the last few episodes, when that stuff was going on, Pacime was being built. And being built with some heavy northern influence. Or maybe the north was being built by some heavy southern influence? We'll say both. But by this point, the Chaco Alta pedal, or the secondary state of Chaco, which was started by the southern immigrants, whatever they were, whether they were priests or diplomats or strongmen or warlords, the southerners who shaped the Chacoan era of plenty and order, they were looking back down south. Maybe they felt their experiment uh, was working up in Chaco Canyon because they began building Pacime around 1130. More likely, it was probably a joint effort of building Chaco to the north and Pacime to the south, near around uh, about the same time. In both great centers, the great houses began to be built, and the Alta pedal began influencing the regions. Might there have been an even further southern center being built simultaneously? I mentioned the great houses in the Chaco episode, uh, and I mentioned that they are a truly unique to the American Southwest phenomenon. Only the Anasazi and Ancestral Puebloans were building them, and that includes the, the Mogollon, and then the Hohokam, to a lesser extent, at the end. But great houses are found nowhere else outside of the four corners. Except, of course, at Pakime. But uh, Stephen Lexon says of Pakime, quote, It's a dozen great houses all jammed together. It's the Emerald City of Oz. This is Chaco translated into Pueblo 4, with a good dollop of Mesoamerica thrown in. End quote. Pueblo 4, uh, in archaeology talk, is the era in southwestern archaeology that contains the years 1350 to 1600. So it's after the Great Divide and Great Migration and end of the Anasazi Civil War, and that's when it really takes off. Pakime, I mean. One faction. I still haven't decided if they were the winners or the losers, or maybe if the Civil War was a draw, and that's why they all left. But one side of the Civil War, packed up their Chaco and Aztec and ways and headed south on the Chaco Meridian to help grow and add on to that newer, bigger, even greater Chaco at Pacume. And that's just what they did. But this time, their numbers had grown exponentially as the main Anasazi spiral migration headed south through New Mexico and Arizona for about 50 odd years. They picked up converts, warriors, slaves, followers, friends. I don't know how the groups interacted as they traveled, to be honest. But by researching and reading and studying others' works, I can paint for y'all a picture of what it looked like as the Anasazi traveled southward on their search for their center place. I can describe to you the evidence they left as they interacted with their Mogollon and Hohokam neighbors. As you'll see... Everywhere these Anasazi migrated through, they brought corn, fire, death, and abandonment of entire regions. Not far from the Four Corners Anasazi homeland, slash battlefield, slash now empty of Anasazi Chaco Altapetal region, there were quite a few centers of living. Large centers of living. And they were popping up at the same time as Chaco and Aztec. So this is before the Great Migration and the Civil War. These places were popping up with Anasazi traits like the Great Houses, Kivas, of course, T-shaped doors, and that almighty maze. And, most recognizable of all, ceramics. So ceramics will be very important in this episode because it's what archaeologists and researchers, uh, it's what they can trace on the landscape to guess where the Anasazi migration headed next. We'll get into that in just a little bit, the ceramics part, uh, but that aspect of the story, the, the ceramics again, is so technical and it doesn't quite lend itself to talking as it's so much better to view them than to hear about them. But anyways, one of these centers of 
uh, that were popping up is a place called Wupatki. You may have heard of Wupatki. You may have even visited Wupatki. And if you haven't, well, you absolutely should. Wupatki sits north of Flagstaff and the San Francisco Mountains, which dominate the southern skyline. It commands uh, an imposing view of the entirety of the landscape. You can see the San Francisco Mountains, Sunset Crater Volcanic Field, and all those lava rocks. And to the northwest, you can make out the Coconino Plateau. Uh, and the Coconino Plateau makes up the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, you can see the Painted Desert that stretches all the way to Petrified Forest National Park. It's an incredible spot, and I've been to it a few times. And I recommend all of my listeners visit it as well. The main ruin of Wupaki, the cleverly titled Wupaki Pueblo, it's the largest residential community for 50 miles in any direction. It was first occupied in 500 AD, but it really took off during the Chaco Aztec Altepetl heydays. And Lexan even suggests it was a rival to Chaco and Aztec. And he's probably right. At least, it was probably a rival to the northern faction of the Chaco and Anasazi. Maybe the ones that went over to the Pueblos. But anyways, the people who built Wupatki and the surrounding centers were of differing origins, like much of the Anasazi segregated world. One of the groups is the Anasazi, of course, or a more specific group of Anasazi known as Kayinta Anasazi. We kind of talked about them. They're being from the Kayinta region. They built uh, the, the Pueblos of Kitsil and Betatakan and a few others near the uh, Monument Valley, Navajo Tribal Park. Uh, another group at Wupaki would be the Sinagua. Sinagua is Spanish for without water. Sin Agua. Uh, they're called the Sinagua because when the Spanish showed up to the San Francisco Mountains of Flagstaff, they couldn't believe that there were no springs or rivers flowing down from the peaks. The Sinagua culture seems to be an extension of the Anasazi, with a more southern and a slightly more Hohokam flair mixed in. But, of course, researchers aren't sure. What is certain is that at Wupaki and many other Sinagua sites, T-shaped doors, Anasazi iconography, and other important Chacoan cultural hallmarks abound at Wupaki, including macaws. Macaws are those very colorful birds from very far south down in Mexico. Uh, they are found in abundance at Chaco, Chaco Canyon. The Maya would use macaw feathers as a form of currency. There are macaw pins in the Membres region of New Mexico, another place we'll talk about soon. But at Wupaki, there were more macaws than there were at Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon during Chaco's height. Remember, Pueblo Benito was that impressively massive great house in Chaco. Uh, it had the incredible burials that reminded archaeologists like Stephen Plogg, who I've also quoted from a lot uh, last time, and will quote again next time, but not so much in this one. But that great house of Pueblo Benito had the amazing and richly adorned graves uh, that reminded the Spanish and a couple archaeologists of Mesoamerican Maya and Toltec burials. And another link with the southern peoples across the Tortilla Curtain, Wupatki has the northernmost Mesoamerican ball court found in the Americas. These Wupatki, Sinaguan, Southern Anasazi clearly had ties to their Uto Aztec and Nahual neighbors from way down south. But they also clearly had ties to their Chacoan friends uh, because Wupatki also features a very large great house and a very large great kiva. Two kivas, actually. And amazingly, if uh, you remember the sun dagger on Fajada Butte in the Chaco episode, um, that sun dagger, the spiral etched spiral that marked the passage of the solstices and seasons, well, Wupatki had one too. Except, curiously, the Wupatki sun dagger does not mark the summer solstice. Um, but the Sun Dagger, that's quite a commanding and strong link to Chaco Canyon. 
I haven't found um, any evidence that Wupaki is linked physically with Chaco using those those fire signal hills, but I guarantee you they're there and they were used. Again, studying those hills is a newer field of research in southwestern archaeology. So the population of Wupatki really takes off at about the same time the Chaco Aztec Altapetl is gaining influence until around 1275, when you'll never guess what happens at Wupaki. I'm kidding. It's abandoned, totally and completely. That's a theme, a major theme, of this episode, as it was at the end of the last episode, and I suppose a theme since the Mammoth Eaters episode when I discussed the Clovis. I mean, they didn't abandon places, but they moved all around. The people of the Americas, especially of the American Southwest. These people are a migratory people. They're always moving, always searching for their center place. It's at this point, it appears this group of Sinagua Anasazi uh, at Wupatki, it appears they split into two groups, just like their Chaco and Aztec cousins. One of these groups no doubt continues on their Chaco Meridian down south, uh, joining their migrating neighbors, and we'll follow them shortly. But first, let's talk about the other group, the group that stayed. Uh, They're known to us today as the Hopi. Probably. Definitely most likely. These uh, Wopatki Sinagua Anasazi that stayed behind as the rest went down south, these ones that stayed behind and didn't continue on, they didn't actually stay at Wupatki itself. But instead, they fled northeastward towards a place known today as Hopi Mesa. Hopi Mesa is actually uh, three mesas, titled First Mesa, Second Mesa, and Third Mesa. But there are other mesas um, nearby as well, such as Antelope Mesa. When the Sinagua Anasazi arrived, um, there were already people living on those mesas. These people already living there in the early 1300s, they appeared to mix with the newcomers, and they became some of the ancestors of today's Hopi Indians. Beneath Hopi Mesa, though, was something that was beginning to be used in the creation of pottery and ceramics. This tool, if you will, was changing the appearance of the pottery, which would overtake the Mesa Verde black on white, and they would overtake it completely. And it would even overtake the Cayenta Redware. And this overtaking pottery... It's known to archaeologists today as Jadido Yellow Ware. And it was made exclusively on the Hopi Mesas. And that's because of the rich deposits of coal that the Hopi used to fire this pottery. Now, I know you've had an earful from me about believing wholeheartedly in oral tradition uh, in the last episode and even a little before that. But it is worth noting that the Hopi of today have stories of their clans migrating from all sorts of differing directions. Some came after a slaughter near Sleeping Ute in southwest Colorado. That place uh, we talked about a little bit, or a lot, in gory detail in the last episode. Others walked from New Mexico. Still others migrated up from Mexico. And still others from the Phoenix Basin, which would have been the Hohokam. Interestingly, The Hopi symbol for migration is a spiral. They believe they found the center of the universe on Antelope Mesa and the other nearby mesas, which is why they never left. Here's a quote from author Craig Childs in his book House of Rain, which is a great book, and which he wrote to help explain where the Anasazi disappeared to. Quote, The famous question of what happened to the Anasazi is partly answered here. They are now called Hopi, living on an island of a reservation, a cluster of mesas settled long ago. They are the ones who did not leave. But of course, there are the ones that did leave. And truthfully, even a lot of Hopi Mesa, or a lot of the Hopi Mesas, were abandoned. 36 of the 47 villages were emptied in the Great Migration. Where'd they go? Well, 
They probably followed the Anasazi down south. We're not done with the Hopi, though. This particular episode is about following the Anasazi down south. But the next episode will be about the ancestral Puebloans, including the Hopi. And it'll be about their way of life, their history, uh, starting after the Great Divide, uh, their intra-warring, and absolutely that Pueblo mystique behemoth, the Kachina culture. Not far from Wupotki, right off of Route 66 and I-40 in Arizona, sits a place known today as Homolovi State Park. In April of 2022, on my way out to move to California from Wisconsin, with the bed of my truck and the passenger seat overflowing with all my crap, and with my old dog in the back seat, uh, we pulled over to stay the night at Homolovi. Unfortunately, I'd gotten there just a bit too late to see the site, and I left before sunrise the next morning, so I didn't get to see it in the morning either. I'll be back one day, but that's not why I'm mentioning it now. It's important because just as the Chaco-Aztec Civil War was about to come to an end, and just before Wupatki and the rest of the Four Corners were abandoned, Homolovi took off. Homolovi may have been one of the first destinations built on the Anasazi's way down south. Although the first major Puebla was built and settled around 1260, it was replaced a few decades later around the Great Migration with five newer Pueblos. Thousands of new rooms went up in a matter of mere months, and they all went up in a spectacularly ordered fashion, and they all went up on man-made hills. Homolovi is actually a Hopi word, which means place of the little hills, and all of those hills were man-made. The area immediately surrounding Homolovi is rather flat, And from the campground, I can confirm you can see the San Francisco mountains near Flagstaff. And they're some 65 miles due west-northwest. My dog and I sat on folding camping chairs in the sandy scrub. And we watched the sunset behind the mountains back in April. It was beautiful. The sunset behind them and it cast like an upside-down triangle into the sky from the shadow. It was really cool. I actually took some pictures, so I'll put them on the site. By 1300, the Pueblo of Homolovi and its many man-made hills, well, no doubt some of those man-made hills being fire signal hills that would have connected it to places further south, but the people of Homolovi were mainly growing and exporting cotton to the ancestral Puebloans that had stayed behind on Antelope Mesa, as well as other nearby and even far-off settlements. And for their cotton, it appears the Anasazi of Homolovi received thousands upon thousands of the coal-fired Jadido yellow ware vessels. But they also passed those vessels on southwards to their still-migrating friends and relatives. I didn't actually read this uh, particular uh, thing I'm about to say anywhere, But it's easy to assume some of the people that became the Hopi's ancestors, some of these Anasazi that stayed behind on Antelope Mesa and and the other nearby mesas, they may have been told or commanded to stay behind by the elites before they headed south with a larger group. The ability to use coal instead of cutting down and burning the very precious resource of timber, especially during the Great Drought, which is for real raging by this point in 1300, Um, It probably helped fuel the continual movement of people out of the area, actually. Although, I don't think the Great Drought was the catalyst for the original movement, uh, but I do think that was the Civil War. But the Great Drought definitely helped fuel further migration. Uh, Back to my thought, though. Uh, What if people were told to stay behind and utilize this coal-fired technique instead of trees on their way down south? And after they fired the wares, they trade them, and then the migrating Anasazi would trade them with the people they were coming into contact with, which were a lot of people. Uh, I could be onto something there, but who knows? Uh, like the rancher Waldo suggested, I'm just guessing. By around 1400, though, the party at Homolovi was over. <laughs> 
and the people either joined their Anasazi ancestral Pueblo and future Hopi friends, or they headed south to join the growing group of migrating Anasazi on their Chaco Meridian Spiral. So, when I say they're following the Chaco Meridian Spiral, I don't actually mean these Anasazi were following the 107 degree line in the landscape Chaco Meridian. I mean, people absolutely did follow that line straight south. And I think that they probably did before the Civil War even got out of hand. Lexon suggests there are sites, great houses, or small pueblos, every 20 or 30 miles on the actual Chaco Meridian. So... The entire group of Four Corners Anasazi who migrated south before and during the Great Divide of 1300, they didn't line up in a straight line and walk it down to Pakime and then beyond. Instead, maybe the leaders and elites and other important people did walk that line, while the rest of the people went from settlement to settlement in Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and even a little Nevada, while going on their way down south. And on their way, they would trade... They would adopt new ways, they would influence entrenched ones, and ultimately they would lead to these settlements' abandonment as well. So, this group were following that had fled Utah, before heading to northern Arizona, before going even further south. Well, this group that was leaving the Colorado Plateau, they were about to run right smack into the Mogollon Rim. And the Mogollon people that inhabited it. Not to mention the Hohokam people that lived beyond that. But they may have had little colonies, or missionary enclaves, or even fifth columns, already among the people in those areas and population centers they were about to run into. If you'll remember my episode, The Anasazi Neighbors, where I talked about the Hohokam and the Mogollon, I mentioned how different the Arizona and New Mexican but definitely how different the Arizona climate, geography, and especially appearance is. Uh, but I mentioned how different all of that is above and below the Mogollon Rim. It's truly two different worlds. Not to mention the rim itself feels so out of place when you think of the Sonoran Desert below and the Colorado Plateau above it. Uh, but really, it's so gorgeous and it's cooler. And it's forested and green, surprisingly green. I recently drove uh, through that Mogollon Rim uh, after leaving Homolovi, which I also mentioned in the episode about the Anasazi neighbors. If you remember the skinwalker elk, you know the one. Well, I could not believe how gorgeous that area was. I want to move there. I knew the area was littered with natural wonders and ruins, but I didn't really know the extent of it until reading Child's book, House of Rain, which is going to be referenced quite a bit from here on out. He really does a fantastic job describing the sites and the migrations and the possible outcome of these amazing people we've been talking about for for months now. These Anasazi spiral migrants. Childs paints the picture, and I enjoyed imagining it, but Child paints a picture of the Anasazi migrating south from up north, making their way to this steep, rocky geological line that is the Mogollon Rim. And the people are standing on the literal edge of the black cliffs and staring southward, seeing smoke from the many, many pueblos, and probably believing that this was theirs for the taking. By this point... The 1300s Great Migration Era. Uh, by this point, the Mogollon people that sat beneath the rim had been hunting plentiful deer, elk, and rabbits, planting and gathering crops, building small pueblos, trading with and even intermarrying with the Anasazi, and they've been doing that for almost 300 years. But now, those ties to the Anasazi were about to heat up and accelerate, like a fire set with stalks of corn. During the 11th century, pottery trade between the Chacoan Anasazi and the Mogollon Rim peoples began to be solidified. Until about the 1300s, when not only pottery made its way south, 
but also entire villages of these Chaco and Aztec Anasazi migrants. At the same time the North was undergoing depopulation, the southern end of the Southwest was being inundated with northern peoples, cultural markers, artifacts, and eventually the Chaco and Anasazi people themselves. And with the people, they brought their kivas, pueblos, and cliff dwellings. Childs quotes archaeologist Jeff Clark, who said of the Anasazi on their migration, quote, Seldom would they have entered unknown territory. They traveled to where they had ties, following lines set by other migrants who'd come through long before them. End quote. Remember those fifth columners I just mentioned? A fifth column is a foreign group of people working within a local system for that foreign group, usually during war. I only used the term fifth column instead of, say, diplomat or missionary or colony because of the civil war that had raged for so long and because of what happens to the Mogollon people later. Hint, hint. Prolonged war ultimately changes a society. Just look at the Spanish, who would later invade Mesoamerica. 700 years of the Reconquista made them perfectly suited to conquering near entire continents. The Reconquista was the 700-year conflict on the Iberian Peninsula that the Spanish and Portuguese, um, but that the Spanish fought against the Muslim Caliphate before finally winning and taking back Spain for the Spanish in the year 1492, which is the same year that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, if you'll remember grade school. Wow, I just used the term grade school. I'm getting old. So 1492 is the same year that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And that is the reason why the Spanish crown, I mean, the Reconquista, but that's the reason why the Spanish crown was so willing to give anybody, even a crazy Italian, a give anybody a fleet who promised them gold and spices in return. But back to our regularly scheduled program, the ancient ones and the Anasazi art of vanishing into thin air. In the 1100s, some Anasazi adventurers had built one of the largest great kivas in the entire southwest, and they built it on the Mogollon Rim. So, a couple hundred years before the Great Migration, this kiva is 80 feet across. And this largest great kiva was actually one of 14 great kivas along this long black cliff in Arizona, with many of these great kivas being the largest kivas ever constructed anywhere in the Southwest. But curiously, these kivas lack the Chacoan kiva characteristics that we've come to know. Childs quotes a different archaeologist, archaeologist Sarah Hare, who says that the Mogollon people were, quote, not aware of certain ceremonial traits that were core to Chaco. They were not from the center. But in many ways, they are Chaco kivas, and they are very much out of place, end quote. The biggest difference in the kivas was that they were probably open air instead of closed dark spaces, which that is a pretty big difference, but it kind of makes sense. This difference in how they were built, it kind of makes sense when you think of the fact that the Hohokam just south of them would have heavily influenced the Mogollon as well, and the Hohokam had open air plazas. And I kind of talked about that in the Anasazi Neighbors episode. There's also, and I don't, it doesn't really, it's not a big deal, but there's also the great distance between the Mogollon and the Chaco and Anasazi. But I just don't see that great distance affecting them all that much. It didn't affect many Americans all that much. I mean, the distance may have affected them a little once they started to settle down into these great houses and pueblos but they still traveled a lot and extensively. And the Anasazi of the American Southwest, they still would have kept up with what Chaco was doing, no matter how far away from that ultipedal secondary center they were. I mean, maybe until the Civil War started. So 
The distance may have played a role, but only because the distance was filled with the quite diverse, dangerous, and difficult terrain of, of the Mogollon Rim, the mountains, the deserts, the canyons, rivers, you know, all that four corners good stuff. But actually, I'm just, I'm not overly convinced the distance or the difficult terrain uh, did anything. The Chaco and Aztec Anasazi, they were in pretty good contact with Pakime, after all, all the way down south. And for some of the Anasazi descendants that we will soon talk about, distance is nothing, and terrain is nothing. I believe it may have been a conscious decision to connect the Anasazi and Mogollon with the Hohokam. That's why they built open-air kivas. I don't feel like I should keep saying it, but it's so true. I don't know. I'm just guessing. All right. So the kivas of the Mogollon Rim were built in the 1100s by some Chacoan missionaries or traders or elites or future fifth columners, what have you. And that is absolutely true. They were built in 1100s. But actually, there's a kiva even older than that on that rim. It's believed to be the very first kiva ever built anywhere in the Southwest. It was built in the 300s AD. That is 700 years before Chaco even takes off. And 300 years before the first ever kiva appears in that mustard-colored canyon. I couldn't really find out too much more about it uh, than what I just said. And I'm not even sure how it fits into our story, or if it's even true. But it sure is interesting. I mean, a kiva... On the Mogollon Rim, built in the 300s? Uh, who came up from Mexico to think of that? I really don't know. It's very cool. But I hope someone publishes something about it soon. Although I do think that the aforementioned archaeologist Sarah Hare did uh, in her 2001 Beyond Chaco. But I couldn't read that. The rest of the Kivas on the Rim, uh, they really come into their own in the 1100s. But the massive pueblos that were built next to these kivas, um, that, that can still be seen today, they weren't constructed until the 1300s. And we know what happened in the 1300s. Think back to those Anasazi migrants standing on the edge of the precipice. The Mogollon Ram population begins to explode after the start of the Great Migration, with people clearly from the north. Things in the archaeological record, really seem to change. Not only do these northerners, which, yes, the northerners I'm discussing now are the same people I've been calling the southern-influenced Chaco, Aztec, and Anasazi Sinaguas. It's tough to parse through all of the designations and cultures and names and nicknames, and at this point I'm not helping by adding my own, and I'm going to continue to give you even more technical terms. But the northerners in this case are the Chaco Aztec Anasazi that were influenced by the southerners from across the tortilla curtain some time ago. And you know what? I'm just going to call them Anasazi for simplicity's sake. I've been doing that for the most part. But from here on out, I'm going to try, at least for a little bit, to just call this diverse group of growing peoples Anasazi. So... The Anasazi began to build their great houses and their smaller kivas amongst the Mogollon. But they also brought their pottery. And lots of it. Once the Chaco and Aztec... See? Once the Anasazi entered the area, the black-on-white pottery that had been in use for over 700 years within the Mogollon region, all that pottery disappears and it is replaced with the coal-fired yellow Jadido ware from far above the Mogollon Rim, near that Hopi Ancestral Pueblo and uh, Antelope Mesa firing place. Not only do the colors change, though, but the ceramics also become much larger, and they seem to feed a whole lot more people, which makes sense when you think of all of the places up north that are abandoned. The people had to have gone somewhere, and the Mogollon Rim is one of those places. But this picture kind of replicates itself all over the southwest. From Sedona to Gila and New Mexico, uh, 
the Four Corners Anasazi leave the Colorado Plateau, and they make their way south, filling every nook and cranny as they love to do. They kind of take over an area, change it to suit their worldview, and then they leave, and they take most of the survivors with them. But uh, again with the pottery, the ceramic vessels uh, that are abounding at the Mogollon Rim area right now that replaced the black on white, these ceramic vessels change in color, shape, and even decoration. The designs on the pottery of the Mogollon people seems to become more playful and kind, as opposed to the rigid images of the Colorado Plateau on Asazi wares. Butterflies and flowers and clouds and birds, they began to appear all over the ceramics. And uh, that motif and change in ceramic designs, it seemingly spread faster and further throughout the Southwest than any other cultural influence had ever done prior. Ever. Maybe the Anasazi wanted to forget about the recent violence and heart-carving dangers they'd fled from up north. Apparently, though, the Anasazi couldn't totally quit their defensive natures, and they never will. In the 1300s, as the migrants fled from up north, as the migrants fled into the area and filled the rim, a familiar form of masonry began showing up. In the sharper, darker, and harsher rocky canyons of the Mogollon Rim, the Anasazi seemingly filled quite a few spaces with their quintessential defensive cliff dwellings those cliff dwellings that they're so well known for on the Colorado Plateau. Maybe they were leery of moving in with the Mogollon people so quickly after moving down there. Maybe they weren't being presumptuous at first. Either way, many of these cliff dwellings were only lived in for a generation or even less before being abandoned. And those Pueblos and Kivas I mentioned earlier began to be built and occupied in the Mogollon area by a growing number of northern peoples. This culture of native Mogollon and migrant Anasazi, uh, it is known to archaeologists today as the Salado culture. Archaeologists and historians and anthropologists Uh, They may disagree with this interpretation of the culture's history that I'm giving you now, but to Craig Childs and a few others, and of course myself, it seems just to make the most sense, and it fits the best into the timeline and material artifacts left behind. I'm talking about the Mogollon and the Anasazi together being the Salado culture. Uh, The Salado culture starts in the 1100s, Um, in the Mogollon area, and it goes until the 1400s when they disappear. It isn't a stretch to imagine those Anasazi missionaries in the 1100s who built the massive kivas and and who began the Salado culture. It isn't a stretch to assume they welcomed their cousins and friends from the Chaco Aztec homeland, and they welcomed them with open arms, especially after they would have gotten word of the violent civil war up north from Childs. In the 13th century, during a time of increasing cultural movement and unrest on the Colorado Plateau, Mesa Verde and Cayenta rose to power with their massive cliff dwellings. Shortly after their fall, 14th century Salado cliff dwellings appears just to the south beneath the Mogollon Rim. These events are not isolated from each other, but are strung together like a row of falling dominoes. Anasazi turning into Salado. An exodus was underway gathering new members and probably losing old ones, expanding, contracting, and pushing ahead with shields, pueblos, polychrome pottery, and cliff dwellings. A vigorous cultural force was dropping through the southwest, following the rains. End quote. When the people from the north, uh, the Anasazi, when they showed up and built their towering structures, The local Mogollon people no doubt mixed with them, and a relationship began that we call the Salado culture. But this relationship was not necessarily a relationship that worked 
both ways. Shortly after the Anasazi appeared, the entire Mokuyon region, which had been ripe and overflowing with trees, deer, elk, and other food sources like cactus and rabbits and mesquite and beans and, well, the area became hunted and gathered out. And then corn was planted. And then it was only a matter of time before the environment, with the great drought, would abandon them. And then the people would follow suit. Childs quotes a southern archaeologist named Jeff Reed, who said, quote, The original Mogollon people were people of diverse resources, not like those northern folk coming on them. They prefer deer and rabbits in their stew rather than corn, 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 like the Anasazi did. End quote. Jeff Reed, who excavated one of the largest sites in the Mogollon Ram region, uh, this site is called Grasshopper, Uh, Jeff Reed talks about how he sees three distinct people inhabiting the area around the 1300s. Quote, Reed called the locals he uncovered at Grasshopper the home team. A second group that he was able to decipher he called Anasazized Mogollon, then offered Mogollonized Anasazi as an alternative. People who at some point left the highlands for the Colorado Plateau where they picked up pottery, habits, and probably northern bloodlines through marriage, and then brought everything back here. A third group Reed recognized as a pure strain of northerners, those he explicitly called Anasazi. That movement and mobility was definitely happening in the southwest, and it helped the fleeing northerners to be able to inhabit this place that was already filled with plenty of inhabitants. Some isotopic measurements of bone and teeth at these Mogollon Rim sites show clear evidence that people from the area, people recently from the north, and people who'd come from the Colorado Plateau sometime before, all three lived in the area, and within these large pueblos, and all at the same time. They seemed to be building these bigger pueblos with the idea of segregation in mind. The Salado people of the Mogollon Rim area were keeping to themselves in one of those three distinct groups that Jeff Reed talked about, and they were doing it within residential room blocks of ethnicities. It kind of reminds me of when similar ethnic uh, groups or immigrants would get off of the boat at Ellis Island in New York And then they would congregate together in cities all across the country, in cities and communities. And they would recreate their old slice of home in this uh, new world of America. Even those in the Mogollon Rim Pueblos that would live outside their genetic community within the Pueblo, uh, let's take for instance like women who'd been married off, those women would still keep their ancestral culture and heritage. Sometimes... Mud used for pottery was brought in from all the way up north, all the way from 100 miles away on the Colorado Plateau. And the same with pigments. Child says, quote, The kinds of wood they preferred for their fires were different even when they all lived in the same environment. End quote. And with the newcomers came the big new pots, uh, the big new kivas, the big new pueblos, and in those big new pueblos, came the T-shaped doors, those very Chaco and T-shaped doors. I know I've mentioned those T-shaped doors before. I mean, they filled every major site, from Chaco to Aztec to Mesa Verde to Bears Ears to the Cayenta region and just about everywhere, all the way down south into Mexico, as we'll learn. They're a truly Anasazi phenomenon. And they don't stop being used after the Civil War and Great Abandonment. The largest site on the Mogollon Rim is in a place called Point of Pines. And it is unlike any other Salado or Mogollon or even Anasazi site in the whole area. By the time the Anasazi northerners had arrived, Point of Pines already had a sprawling one-story pueblo with much smaller rooms, 
It had a pottery style indicative of even further south instead of up north, so not the yellow coal-fired wares, but something more Mimbres black on white. That tradition that was around for 700 years. Point of Pines really had almost no influence from the Colorado Plateau at all. Well, that changed rather rapidly when the northern newcomers took over. They quickly set about building much larger pueblos, both in height and in square space right in the middle of the already existing town. They brought their bright pottery and built their big D-shaped Chaco and Kivas right into the ground. But they brought even more than that. Childs says, quote, They brought with them strains of corn, beans, and squash that were previously unknown here products of the Colorado Plateau, and they did not share. None of these strains have been found in any of the surrounding sites. End quote. It was as if the Anasazi were coming here and setting up shop at Point of Pines regardless of if anyone lived there or not, or regardless if anyone even wanted them there or not. It seemed to the Anasazi to be a perfect spot for their spiral migration. But, as with most of these Salado spots, it would prove to be a temporary home. After only 30 years, Point of Pines goes up in flames. Not the entire site, mind you, but every single migrant household was burned. And in each burned building was thrown in loads of freshly gathered corn. And sometimes, living humans. Here's another child's quote. I once saw the remains of that end in a series of bins in an archaeological collection. The bins were filled with masses of burned corn excavated from point to pines. The kennels turned molten and fused together. Each room, belonging to migrants, was burned early in the 14th century, many of the chambers loaded with freshly harvested corn. Excavators found bodies in the burned wreckage. In one room... A man, a woman, and two children sprawled on the floor. A skull was unearthed, its shell blackened and popped open, revealing a powdery gray lump inside. The lump was a carbonized brain, evidence that these people had still had their soft parts intact near the time of the fire. It seems that they had been burned alive, or shortly after their death. Curiously, None of the surrounding rooms lived in by locals had been damaged by the fire. Only the proud migrant enclave had been burned. End quote. Reading House of Rain, I learned that corn actually burns much hotter than wood. And corn is also capable of shattering rock and even melting walls. It seems the Anasazi migrants had worn out their welcome. Or... Maybe they set the fire themselves once it was time to go. It seems a generation of time passing before moving on is the theme for these corn-bringing, T-shaped doorway-building, Kiva-constructing northern Anasazi migrants. Once the newcomers had left, and their northern-style pottery was burnt to a crisp, with uh, some inhabitants still inside, but after the fire... Point of Pines' remaining residents built the most substantial perimeter wall of the 1300s in all of the Southwest. Make of that what you will, but it makes me doubt that the Anasazi set that fire themselves as they left. It's more likely that, as Child says, quote, It was a message. Point of Pines will take no more of these northern people, these people of fire, end quote. You don't see perimeter walls in the southwest too often. We've talked about some sites that have them, uh, like in the last episode, uh, but they're not a standard practice among the Anasazi, I don't think. But I do know of at least one large one. I've parked my truck just outside of it. I walked over that crumbling wall to explore the ruins within. I was in Agua Fria National Monument, uh, and the site's name, well, the site's name has recently been deemed politically incorrect, or whatever. But it was an impressive site. I actually did briefly mention it in the last episode, I believe. 
Uh, the large site has 150 to 200 room blocks, some petroglyphs, a few remaining pieces of beautiful pot shirts that I got to hold in my hand before placing back, an impressive view on the edge of the Mesa Cliff of the mountains to the east, I'm not sure which ones they were, and the Mesa Top to the west, and the Bradshaw Mountains to the far west beyond that. Uh, surrounding the site was a massive wall. A uh, quick side note about this cool site that I got to visit. One quite curious thing about it is the quote-unquote racetrack that archaeologists only recently discovered uh, was there on the ground outside of the perimeter wall after they had been studying some aerial photographs. I certainly couldn't see this racetrack from the ground even though I knew it was there. And even though it measures something like 400 feet long and 70 feet wide. And it's oriented in a straight north-south orientation. My guess is, and this is just a guess, but uh, since the Sinagua built this site and since they were somewhat ho-ho-com, it could have been an evolution of the ball game. They just didn't build the ball courts anymore. Although Wupatki is further north and they did build a ball court, and at 400 feet long, that's... Hmm. It's a bit too big. No, that's a lot too big for a Mesoamerican ball game. But maybe the racetrack served the same function as a Mesoamerican ball court, um, which there weren't any in the area except for up north in Wupaki. Uh, they certainly built that massive site surrounding wall, though. So the Sinagua built this site I was just talking about, and they built it between the years 1250 and 1450. Uh, that means the wall makes sense especially if they were keeping out uh, those northern migrant newcomers, or at least the threat of even newer ones after the Anasazi left. Other sites, uh, nearby sites built by the Sinagua, they also seem to be very defensive in nature. How closely tied to the Anasazi were these Sinagua? If they really wanted to keep them out, maybe it's a similar situation to the Salado. Or maybe they were just much more closely tied to the Hohokam than to their northern uh, Anasazi cousins. Uh, one of these defensive Sinagua sites nearby, and that nearby to um, the site that I was just talking about with the racetrack, one of those defensive Sinagua sites is called Tuzigut, and it's essentially a hilltop fortress. It's a little national monument near Sedona, and it's got a Great little museum, and it's pretty awesome to see. Uh, not far from Tuzigut is Montezuma's Castle, another amazing and quite famous national monument that was a very defensive Sinagua site. And at Montezuma's Castle, recent research suggests that uh, this story I'm telling y'all about, the story of northern migrants and corn fires, well, this story repeats itself at Montezuma's Castle. Montezuma was the Aztec leader when the Spanish got to the future site of Mexico City, which was at that time called Tenochtitlan. And like Aztec National Monument in New Mexico, a lot of European people named things in the American Southwest after the Aztecs uh, because they simply could not believe the Indians who inhabited the area, or Indians at all, really. But they refused to believe the natives could have built the structures they were seeing all around them. Now, the European immigrants were partially correct, but for very wrong reasons. The Navajo and Apache didn't build the ruins the immigrants were seeing, but in fact their neighbors, uh, their neighbors' ancestors, the Navajo and Apache's neighbors' ancestors, did. And we've been talking about them, and will again a lot more in the next episode. The Pueblo people, the ancestral Puebloans, hence the name. But of course, if the Sinagua and Anasazi spoke a Nahual-related Uto-Aztecan language, well, then the Aztecs didn't build the ruins the European immigrants were seeing in the Southwest, but their cousins sure did. Distant cousins, anyways. Matt Gubard, an archaeologist with the National Park Service, he did some further studies uh, on the burned ruins and buried bodies that were uncovered decades ago at the castle, Montezuma's castle. And when he did, he found that the story of a peaceful end and ritual fire needed to be amended. 
So the old story went that the people left Montezuma's castle, and when they did, they ritually set the place ablaze, which we know the Anasazi did because we discussed it last time. But not this time. Gubard is interviewed in a piece by Blake DiPastino for Western Digs magazine, where he quotes Gubard. But a closer examination of previous research done on those remains revealed that the dead had sustained trauma before their deaths, as evidenced by cut marks on their bones, burn marks, and fractures in three of the four skulls. We learned that the interior portion of each fracture displayed evidence of singeing on live bone, Gubard said. So the sequence of events seems to be blunt trauma followed closely by burning. It is also interesting to note that all of the remains with reported evidence of trauma and burning were found in a single grave. End quote. Archaeologists aren't sure who set the fire, or why, or who burned. But if the pattern we've been outlining of the Anasazi migrants coming in, overstaying their welcome, and then being burned, sometimes alive, in a fire of corn, well, if that pattern is regional, it sure seems to fit at the castle as well. That being said, that sure does fit well into my story, right? Well, it may not have been the Anasazi migrants who set the fire and killed the inhabitants. But instead, Apache migrants who arrived 200 years before the Apache were thought to have arrived in the area, as in the southwest, because they came from way up north. That interpretation was gleaned by using some Apache oral traditions, but, well, we've talked a lot about using oral traditions in archaeology and even in this episode already. And we've talked about how it can be a slippery slope. Often helpful, and sometimes useful, and always important to take into account, but to rely upon them? That can be tricky. I'm not totally sure the Anasazi migrants had anything to do with burning Montezuma's castle, but I am totally sure that their previous arrival and then later departure made the Sinagua, just like it made their Mogollon Salado neighbors, But the Anasazi's ultimate migration out of the area led the people in Arizona, like the Sinagua and Salado, to start building much more defensively with massive walls and hard-to-reach strongholds that we call castles today. Here's another slightly off-topic side note for you. I'm not totally sure why historians and anthropologists and archaeologists are stuck on the dates for when the Navajo and Apache arrived from up north. And maybe not all of them are stuck. It just seems like everything I read just says the same thing over and over again, that they got there at a certain year. But uh, like I discussed in the last episode, it's totally possible the Navajo participated in the Anasazi Civil War. They certainly arrived not long after the Anasazi left, but it doesn't matter too much to our story if they participated or not. The Navajo and Apache will feature a little more in the next episode, but they're just totally separate from the ancestral Puebloans and Anasazi. And the Navajo will have their own episode. I mean, I've talked a good bit about the Apache in the Buffalo Soldiers episode, and I have promised a Navajo series next year. I do, though, I do think the Navajos and Apache's arrival to the southwest wasn't an accident after the Ancient Ones left. I think some Navajo and Apache explorers or adventurers, I think they witnessed the end of the Civil War and the almost complete abandonment of the Anasazi Four Corners region. Then they waited a few years, and when no one returned um, to that Four Corners Colorado Plateau land, I mean, not even to pay their respects. Nobody really returned to visit sacred sites. As a matter of fact, the ancestral Puebloans and the modern Puebloans don't really return to those abandoned sites in the Four Corners area. They believe some bad stuff went down. And the Navajo believe some bad stuff went down, if you don't remember the last episode. And maybe they know that because they were there. Or maybe the the ancestral Puebloans told them. But maybe... They witnessed the abandonment, and then when nobody came back, they 
sent word for the rest of their people to come down and fill in this nearly empty, abundant space. Because the Navajo and Apache, they're, they're kind of cousin groups, kind of like the Mogollon and Hohokam and Sinagua and Salado and Anasazi. The Apache and Navajo are closely related. They both speak Athabascan languages. And they both kind of made it down to the Four Corners region at the same time after the Anasazi had left. But unfortunately for them, they weren't quite as adept at farming as the old inhabitants had been. Plus, the great drought really hurt their chances to flourish. And, uh, I mean, the Navajo definitely still farmed. They farmed corn. Uh, Whether they learned it from the ancestral Puebloans after the Anasazi left, or from the Anasazi themselves before they left, the Navajo could indeed farm. And according to the Crow Canyon archaeology website, the word Navajo comes from the Spanish pronunciation of an ancestral Puebloan Tewa word, Navajo, which means farm fields in the valley. The first Spanish in the area actually called the Navajo Apaches de Navajo, but eventually shortened it to what we use today, Navajo. The Navajo called themselves the people, or Dine, so while the Navajo could indeed farm, they weren't as adept as the Anasazi had been, and they didn't have help from the Great Drought, like I just mentioned. It isn't overly relevant to our story right now of where the Anasazi go, and maybe it would fit better in the next episode, or even in just the Navajo series. But it does help uh, to reinforce the idea of the Americans being an extremely migratory people. Whether these Americans are from Central America or far North America. I open this episode with a wink and a nod possibility that the Anasazi's ancestors, and not ancient ones, but more recent ones, Oh, okay, maybe some ancient ones as well. But the Anasazi's ancestors were from the area around central Mexico. That's what I opened the episode with. And they were there before going northwest until they established the Chaco Meridian. And then they head straight north on that line from the ocean. Is that a long way? Oh, it sure is. But the Aztecs of Montezuma, the Montezuma that would unfortunately meet Cortez, But the Aztecs spoke a language quite similar to the Hopi people of modern Arizona that we've talked about, that Uto-Aztecan language. That's quite a long distance as well. And you know what's an even longer distance with extremely diverse terrain in the way? The area the Navajo and Apache are from, or believed to have traveled from, which is northern Canada and Alaska. So deep-rooted Southerners came up and helped build Chaco before returning, which we're talking about now, and deep-rooted northerners filled in the spaces when the southerners left. Maybe one day the Navajo and Apache would have gone back north, but we'll never know. There were some important things that happened in between then. In that very awesome email conversation I had with the awesome Steve Lexon, He mentions the fact that some very Maya-looking individuals have been found buried in a settlement in the Sierra Madres, between Paquime and a city I've mentioned in the state of Sinaloa called Culiacan. The state of Sinaloa, by the way, is the same state as the Las Labradas site on the beach, the one with the big black volcanic rocks and the spirals that it sits almost on the Chaco Meridian. But Lexon said that some very Maya-looking individuals in a Maya-looking settlement have been found quite far from their Maya homeland. And that, quote, Folks were getting around. It's not all north to south. End quote. The Anasazi Spiral Salado Migrants, or just the Anasazi as I promised I would call them, were still in the 1300s, by the way. But the Anasazi left the Mogollon Rim area and their newer cliff dwellings and their pueblos in Point of Pines and their segregated areas, and they traveled to southeast Arizona next, which was, again, a land filled with people already living there. These people that were already living there They were heavily influenced, and they really interacted with the Mimbres to the east, 
and the Hohokam to the west. When they had even less influence from the Anasazi and the Colorado Plateau than the Rim peoples, and their area was densely populated, and it had its own unique culture. And then the Anasazi Salado arrived. Again from Childs. Salado was the new world order, as the old guard cultures of Hohokam, Membres, Mogollon, and Anasazi were swept up into cohesive assembly. End quote. If there's one thing recent history has taught me, new world orders are no good. By now, the pottery of these Salado Anasazi people, it had continued to evolve. And its changes and evolution with those, it became more elaborate with each new migration. And this new pottery, just like the last new pottery, it was heavily sought after everywhere the Anasazi traveled, and even to places where they didn't travel to. The pottery everyone loved in the southwest at this point is cleverly called Salado Polychrome. And you should look up Salado Polychrome on the line. It is beautiful. Uh, by this point, though, it looks like the people have mixed the old black on white and their patterns with the red cayenne to wear and the Jadido yellow. But by the mid-1300s, the Salado Polychrome, it was everywhere and everyone was using it. From northern Mexico to northern Arizona and all the way to El Paso in Texas, the people couldn't get enough of Salado Polychrome. But like everywhere else in this story so far, the newcomers did what they always do. And in southeast Arizona, they set up camp and build their huge, impressive, beautiful buildings and northern-style kivas with influences of Chaco, of course, and a little bit of southern Utah, too. A buried body at the site of Goat Hill in a nearby small town called Safford, Arizona, this site uh, was built on top of a large butte that overlooks the existing one-story pueblos, kind of like a castle, kind of like Tuzigut. But that buried body discovered in the castle had come from 300 miles away. And you guessed it, 300 miles to the north. And much like at Betatakan and Navajo National Monument and quite a few other sites, the newcomers to the area of southeast Arizona, they came in orderly waves with people coming and building not only for themselves, but for people they knew would join them later. It was essentially yet another planned Anasazi community, or so. That's what the archaeology suggests. Once all the migrants from up north had completed their construction, which, of course, contained a massive D-shaped kiva, but once the Salado Anasazi migrants had moved into their planned pueblos, they also fully occupied every available living site for miles around. They filled every canyon cranny and hilltop nook with their Anasazi spiral salado migrant, slowly evolving way of life. Even 100 miles to the west, in Tucson, excavations have turned up heavy influences from the north. Today, if you go to Saguaro National Park, and you head to the western section, the western Tucson Mountain District, there's a hike. A beautiful hike with both rough and rugged mountains all around. I mean, it is beautiful. Uh, you also have tons of tall saguaros. But on this hike, called the Signal Hill Trail, you can hike to a group of blackened and gray rocks, which are framed with the beautiful mountains behind them as you turn around and look south. On a sharp pyramid-looking rock sits a beautiful and elaborate and, to me, unmistakably Anasazi spiral. 
Well, I guarantee smarter people than I would disagree that it is an Anasazi spiral. And maybe I've been looking at so many Anasazi spirals that I just see them everywhere, whether they're just the universal spiral or not. But a picture I took of this spiral on the little rock will be up on the site. Did the Anasazi etch this spiral into the rock before descending into the Hohokam territory? Right before it all came crashing down? We will probably never know that answer. Childs in House of Rame says 200 years after these hilltop forts and pueblos and castles were built and subsequently abandoned, of course, in southeast Arizona, the Spanish would come across them. And they would call these fortified and walled ruins. They would say that they were, quote, built by civilized and warlike foreigners who had come from far away, end quote. Far away indeed. Far away up north. Except everywhere these Salado Anasazi went, they had to have picked up converts, new family members, wives, husbands, children, friends, slaves, right? They certainly picked up new ideas and incorporated them into their own, their own migrating and ever-changing pantheon of beliefs on their way down south. In the Anasazi Neighbors episode, I talked about the evolution of the Hohokam and how they went from ball courts and platform mounds to, well, no more ball courts and walled mounds, and how they started having entire parts of their cities becoming walled off. Not only did walls start to flood into the area of the Hohokam, but the all-popular Anasazi Salado polychrome flooded the Hohokam scene almost as if one of their many amazing dams had burst, spewing that northeastern style all over and down the Phoenix Basin. But even beyond pottery, the northerners may have inundated the Hohokam area with new beliefs. And with those new beliefs, came ritual practitioners who could oversee this new northern belief from childs. The Tohono O'odham, who now live in southeastern Arizona, call the people who ruled these Hohokam platform mounds Siwanya, with an Inya at the end, not just an N. That word is a word that is phonetically out of place in the O'odham's Pima language. When spoken out loud, Siwanya is nearly identical to Shiwani, a word from the Colorado Plateau, and a Zuni term for their rain priests. Siwanya and Shiwani are similar enough in two completely different languages that they suggest a connection, a word left in the southern lands by northern travelers. The name of rain priests from the north was planted like a flag in the mighty Hohokam platform mounds of southern Arizona. End quote. And again, please excuse my pronunciation. I don't speak Pima or Zuni or really even Spanish all that well. It's now believed, or at least for some researchers it's believed, but Tohono O'odham may have descended from the Hohokam. They may have been the ones that stayed behind, while the rest of the Hohokam may have followed the Anasazi south, much like the Hopi's ancestors stayed behind. So, for the Hohokam, along with words, religion, and pottery, when the Anasazi arrived, they also brought castles, walls, and ruins that later excavations will reveal are filled with slaughtered human remains. By the 1400s, the area of southern Arizona, you'll find this absolutely shocking, I guarantee it, but the whole place was abandoned. Shortly after the Salado spiral Anasazi migrants seemingly invaded the entire area, stretching resources then building monuments, and conquering cultures, the Salado Anasazi and the original Hohokam and Mogollon inhabitants disappeared. <laughs>
it appears the entire region of the American archaeological southwest was destabilized. From Childs. Communities began falling apart. A century of woodcutting, hunting, and intensive farming had decimated the land during a time of unprecedented growth. Pueblos began competing for resources. This competition shattered critical trade networks, severing the cultural fabric that held these regions together. The sharing of resources, ideas, and artifacts in the area ceased. People began to scatter once again, heading for distant sanctuaries. Birth rates declined. People died younger as malnutrition coursed through their remaining settlements. End quote. Many of the sites I've recently talked about, like Point of Pines, Grasshopper, Homolovi, they were all completely abandoned. Even the stragglers, well, they also eventually left, just like it happened in the north. After the large pueblos dwindled, smaller one-story homes were built, like the older, pre-migrant days. But before long, even they were left desolate and empty in the region of the Mogollon Rim and southern Arizona, even up into the Colorado Plateau. Remember when I said 37 of the 46 ancestral Hopi pueblos were eventually abandoned? Places that held families and communities, places that had seen birth and life and death, places that had given rise to new beliefs and strengthened old ones, places that had been homes for almost a thousand years were almost all left to ultimately be fascinating features on the landscape for much later migrants, migrants from surprisingly even further away. But they were left for later, far-off migrants to find. And all of it, all of this abandonment, it all occurred after those spiral Salado Anasazis had arrived, taken over, planted corn, flourished, and then left. Oftentimes, they left with fire and death in their wake. Whether it was their own deaths or the deaths of those who opposed them, well, that's unclear. But fire and death signaled the Anasazi's departure almost every time. Even those later built walls by those who stayed behind couldn't help the people who'd spent quite a bit of time and generations settled into their homes in pueblos of southern Arizona. Now, I will say, for the people of the Americas, it does kind of seem like settling into anywhere is certain death, or certainly has a degenerating effect. I'm kind of thinking of uh, modern reservations. But the Anasazi absolutely and seemingly prioritized the downfall of their neighbors after their own tragic and violent man-corn civil war. And the great drought wasn't helping anything either. At this point, the Anasazi spiral, well, it might as well represent a black hole. I've only ever been to Mexico three times. The first time was when I was 15, and my parents took us there, my whole family, there are five kids. My parents flew us from Atlanta to DF. Uh, which is District Federale, which is just Mexico City. So we flew to Mexico City, and we sat in the airport, and the AC was broken. And it was so hot, and the smog was pretty rough. It kind of constricted my little lungs. Uh, and then we got to our little, well, you know, it was a nice resort, condo, whatever. Uh, I, was, I was privileged as a kid. Uh, we got to our timeshare in Mexico, in Acapulco, on the coast, the Pacific coast. And it was an amazing trip. I remember a lot of it, but what I really remember was the time where I uh, surfed for the first time. I had grown up in Georgia, and I was obsessed with surfing when I was a teenager. I subscribed to magazines. I watched. So I would like download surfing videos in the morning and then go to school and then come back from school and hope the three-minute surfing video had like downloaded from the internet because I'm old. Uh, and... So I got to surf, uh, and there was like a tropical storm coming, and so the waves were big. It was my first time ever. 
I hated it. It sucked because every wave that hit me just pushed me back. And then I saw this guy, this local dude come out and then dive, push his board under the water and dive with it under the waves that came. And I was like, oh, that's what you got to do. So I did that. And then it was fun. I stood up one time, but terribly. I didn't last but for like five seconds. And then I was too tired because it was hot and I was thirsty and I was a kid. Uh, and it's amazing that the the worker at the um, resort let me borrow his board. It was a short board, but he let me borrow it. Some gringo who had never served, he didn't even know that. He just let me borrow it just for free. Nothing. It was awesome. And definitely shout out to that Mexican resort worker in Acapulco, you know, however many years ago that was. We won't talk about it. Maybe 20. Oh my goodness. It was probably 20 years ago. The second time I went to Mexico was quite a different story. It was 2014. I was on a summer road trip from Wisconsin down to New Mexico. And I woke up in Bottomless Lakes State Park near Roswell. And then I spent the morning in Carlsbad Caverns, which were absolutely amazing. And then I had some time to kill, but also I wasn't feeling great, so I didn't know what to do. Uh, it turns out I had a very high fever. I don't know what happened, but I drove from Carlsbad Caverns on the border of Mexico and Texas all the way to El Paso. I parked my truck and then I walked across the border. You got to pay like a little 50 cent thing to get across the border to Mexico. Coming back to America, yeah, you got to show your passport and ask and prove why you're there. It's garbage. Anyways, so walked across the border to Mexico. I was looking, you know, just for some fun, for some enjoyment. So I took pictures of the church, the Catholic churches. It was Sunday, so it was like market day, I guess, or something. It was beautiful. It was fun. Tons of people, food, smells, uh, vendors. You know, there was like cartel rap, and there was... Uh, people dressed as clowns performing. There were preachers screaming about God from these uh, gazebos in the town square. Uh, and then, uh, but I was, it was really hot. It was June and I had a high fever and oh my gosh, I felt so bad and I was sweating so badly. And I had this whole experience, which you'll have to wait to read about when I release my, my book. Anyways, I had this whole experience. I came back to the States the border guards, uh, they were like, what is wrong with this dude? But I had to like promise them I wasn't on drugs or didn't have any drugs or whatever. And I got to back to my truck and it was so hot and I was so tired and I drank this hot water and I was dying. And I was hallucinating from this high fever. That was my second trip. Uh, the third trip was in March of 2020. I parked my truck on the American side, obviously. Um, just south of Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in Arizona. And I walked across the border, uh, the same border where all the Phoenix and Tucson gringos drive their big old trucks and boats down to uh, Puerto Penasco. So I walked across the border for a burrito and a little a cerveza, a little refreshment. Uh, that was fun. And then I walked back. Not a problem. You know, those are my three times of going to Mexico. I just really wish it was easier to go to Mexico. And honestly... Now that I live in Orange County, Southern California, I'm less than two hours from the border. And I really am trying to convince my wife to come with me all the way down to the very tip of Baja, California. What a road trip that would be. But not just the southern tip of Baja, California. All of these places I'm about to talk about would be a fantastic road trip. If only it were just easier and safer to travel to Mexico. So I haven't been to any of these sites that I'm about to talk about. So that means I am trusting the eyes and minds of the many authors and archaeologists and historians that I've been mentioning quite often this entire episode, and the many before it. I'm about to quote and reference and summarize a lot of Craig Childs in his book House of Rain, but also... David Roberts, in his uh, The Lost World of the Old Ones, as well as the great and powerful Stephen Lexon, of course. But also, I'll be talking about and mentioning a whole lot more smarter and better traveled men and women than I. Curiously, one, uh, not source, but one person I read a little from, uh, is somebody that I used to know, not too personally, he was a professor of mine at the University of Oklahoma. Um, he's a published researcher and archaeologist named Paul Minnis. But uh, Minnis doesn't quite agree with the direction I'm about to take and the direction the authors I just mentioned uh, have taken, especially the direction of Steve Lexon. Uh, 
Uh, Lexan says of archaeologists, like Minnis, that they created entire careers out of diminishing the importance and grandness of the Pacime site in northern Mexico, while also disputing what that original gringo archaeologist who excavated it in the late 50s, a man named Charles de Peso, but they diminish the importance of what de Peso found. As Lexan puts it about researchers and archaeologists, quote, whole careers have been made out of pulling de Peso apart. I call it devaluing de Peso, end quote. Lexan loves his puns. But at the University of Oklahoma, Paul Minnis was one of my professors, and I took two courses from Paul Minnis. And he was great, and I really enjoyed the courses uh, that he taught. I still remember the the classroom in the the old, I think it was architecture building. It was beautiful, uh, but it was so long ago, and I don't remember all that much from college. I'll be honest, but I do remember that Paul Minnis was adept at studying coprolites, coprolites as in fossilized feces, and in college I thought that was pretty rad. I still do, actually. From here on out, though, I'm trusting those more traveled and researched and intellectual authors and scientists and researchers and archaeologists that I just mentioned, and a couple others. I am trusting them to guide me through to the end of the Anasazi story. In the Chihuahua Desert of northern Mexico, there is a place that exists with roads. Very Chacoan roads. Very Chacoan roads that radiate out from the center of this site into the many hundreds of surrounding villages. Not only straight old roads, but mounds that once held those signal fires. Not only mounds with cracked stones broken from intense heat. Not only those mounds, but also a tower. A very Anasazi-looking tower. And all of this is near that prehistoric site that I mentioned called Pacime, near Casas Grandes, Mexico. Pacime is a place larger and more condensed than anything in the American Southwest, and a place that was probably the most remarkable society in all of the Southwestern region. It was more impressive than both Chaco and Hohokam. Pacime had two thousand central rooms. Lexan thinks it held, the site itself, 4,700 people, and it probably had two rulers. It stood at five stories tall. It had ball courts, small pyramids, a snake effigy mound, a bird effigy mound, canals to bring water, and canals to take water away. And in the very center of it, the residents had built a staircase that led 40 feet down into a well. They had that precious, precious water. Pakime was established in the early centuries after Christ, but it really took off by around 1300. At the same time, you'll note that the northerners began their spiral journey that would eventually lead them to this very spot at Pakime. And Pekki may have, may have only had 4,700 residents, but much like Chaco, the surrounding area was filled with tens of thousands of people. The site would have been a cultural beacon for peoples in a 30,000 square mile radius. From Texas to Arizona to northern Mexico, at Pekki May proper, there are rooms a thousand square feet, while others are only 30 square feet. The largest building at the site covered a full acre. The place is enormous, honestly, and sprawling. The people that lived there, they ate corn, beans, and squash, of course, but also hunted our friend the bison. Ceramic vessels have been dug up in detailed shape of naked men and women, which is kind of a Mesoamerican theme. There are ceramic vessels of men smoking pre-Columbian cigarettes, and they're all decorated with those famous southwestern geometric designs. Except, at Pakime, they're even more exotic. It was a place of immense skill and beauty. At Pakime, they were forging copper, 
making shell jewelry, and erecting structures littered, or really decorated, I guess. Much better word. But the place is decorated with those T-shaped Anasazi Pueblo doorways. They are truly everywhere. And they were doing all of this with a clearly evident, very strict hierarchy. But there are some apparent differences that exist between this place and the old Chacoan settlements. Clear evidence of human sacrifice exists, not just hints of it like a Chaco. A giant effigy mound in the shape of a horned serpent lays near the city. Quetzalcoatl, anyone? A ton of macaw pens lay in a room dubbed by Charles de Peso, House of the Macaws. While macaws and macaw pens did exist up in uh, Chaco and Wupaki and other places as well, these were different. They took care of these birds here at Pakime. The people gave them sunlight and created humidity and made sure their bones didn't become soft and worthless like the ones found in the Four Corners area. Because macaws are from the jungle, not the dry, dry desert. Excavations from Pakime's lower floors, underneath the spiral migrants' grand city. Those excavations show pottery from 400 miles away in northeast Arizona. The pottery and ceramics had arrived there as early as the 1100s. Sounds similar to the Mogollon Rim. And pottery from the western coast of Mexico, near the possible home of Aztalan, which is where the Aztecs have probably migrated from before ending up at Tenochtitlan. But ceramics from the Mexican coast have been found in Pacime alongside the Four Corners pieces. Childs says of Pacime, quote, From the beginning, this place was a cultural repository for a much more extensive region, connecting to far provinces like the Colorado Plateau, well before Lexan's Chaco Meridian came into play. The common archaeological view of Pacime as existing on the periphery is false. The ancient city or the community surrounding it may have been where many migrants from the north were heading. It is probably no coincidence that Pacime rose to power while Chaco was disbanding and reached its apex in the time that nearly all of the southwest was in motion. Lexan may be right. All roads that once led to Chaco now lead straight to Pacime. End quote. Lexan believes that when the Anasazi left Chaco, they went to Aztec, and then spread out throughout the Four Corners Colorado Plateau area, as we've talked about extensively. But when they were done with Aztec and the Civil War happened, they headed 400 miles due south on a straight line to Pacime, where they ran into some locals, these people that were already here, and they spun them into their spiral and made the city what it is, or was. Childs, uh, talking about Lexan's theory of Anasazi in Mexico, says, quote, Newly arrived migrants from the Colorado Plateau whipped everyone into shape, shouting orders this way and that, and pretty soon had a new ceremonial city built for themselves at the foot of the Sierra Madre. Here, they indulged in heavily ritualized habits of human sacrifice, as they had a Chaco, wearing necklaces made of human bones and dressing in feathers of turkeys and exotic jungle birds as they presided over colorful rituals." End quote. Lexan's not the first to suggest migrants from the north came to Pakime, though. In 1890, the Norwegian archaeologist Karls Sofus Lumholtz posited the same theory while he lived in Mexico among the Tarahumara, a group we'll come back to shortly, and for a good reason. But he lived in the area of northern Mexico for quite some time. He gave a series of lectures on, uh, quote, the characteristics of cave dwellers of the Sierra Madre, end quote. And he described plenty of archaeological sites. The man knew his indigenous northern Mexicans, and he could see a connection between them and the pueblos of the Colorado Plateau Four Corners area, the Anasazi. Nearby to Pacime, on a small mountain named Cerro Moctezuma, is another set of ruins known as El Pueblito, Little Pueblo, and it's built almost completely in the fashion 
of the spiral Anasazi migrants. Obviously, with a lot of Mesoamerican thrown in there as well. Some of the walls of the dilapidated ruins of El Pueblito are 11 feet tall. Up on the little mountain, there was also an effigy snake. Not mound, but wall. Just like a pacume. And it pointed straight north. A massive tower also stood at the site that would have been bigger than anything ever built in the southwest, but it seemed to be able to peer all the way over to the Colorado Plateau itself, above the Mogollon Rim. And from Pakime, a fire or a mirror signal would have reached Aztec in 15 minutes if everyone was doing their job. Lexan, in Robert's Lost World, even quips about how the site, El Pueblito, looks identical to Aztec North and Aztec National Monument. But truthfully, Pacume is pretty Mesoamerican as well. As I mentioned, it's got ball courts, horned serpent mounds, which is a huge thing in Mesoamerica. It's got a plethora of human sacrifice and clear, rigid hierarchy. Not to mention the religion. The architecture of Pacume hints at Mesoamerican uh, rain, thunder, and feathered serpent priests. And the feathered serpent is Quetzalcoatl. It hints at those priests uh, who could emerge out of hiding places to wow the crowd, and they would also communicate with the deities, which is exactly how those Maya and other Mesoamerican cultures did things. So the architecture of Pakime hints at some pretty Mesoamerica Maya Toltec situations. Besides the ball courts and the priests and the human sacrifice, some of the differences between Pakime and, Anas and the Anasazi are in iconography and ceramics. Some of the differences are simply in the color they painted, um, painted important symbols and other thing, and the ceramics themselves. Other differences are in the designs, but the two, the Northern Anasazi and the Southern Pakime, were sometimes in, truthfully, complete opposition of each other, or a yin and yang situation. Were they two pieces of the same puzzle, as Childs puts it? It seems that when the two cultures, the Pakime residents and the spiral Anasazi migrants, when they were in close proximity to each other, at Pakime, the two different cultures did not mix. That sounds familiar. And where sites exist that had both of them living together, they were segregated, or on opposite sides of town. Like where ball courts existed, the northern pottery did not. Just like it happened on the Mogollon Rim and in southern Arizona and on Mesa Verde. A separate segregation of the two cousin cultures another theme of Pakime and the Anasazi. Childs speaks to archaeologist Christine Van Poole, who says this about the two cultures. Quote, It may be like some Christians making a cross one way and others making it another way. You're very similar, you have basic tenets, but you keep separate. Like Eastern Orthodox versus Roman Catholic. I believe the Americas share many central religious tenets. The horned serpent images that are Pan-American all have to do with sky and underworld, water and earth. They're prevalent in every single group, and in many groups, they are paramount. We see it with the Aztecs and Olmecs. We see it in the eastern woodlands of North America, where there are feathered rattlesnake images. We see it at Pakime. There are horned, feathered serpents at Chaco and petroglyphs. These are icons tied to to traditions that had to do with the propagation of rain and water, traditions that lie at the root of these cultures, end quote. And she's not wrong. I studied the Maya extensively in college and even a little afterwards when I thought maybe I wanted to go back into the field for a doctorate. Oh, dodged a bullet there. I suppose, though, I am still studying the Maya as I study the Southwest, in a way. If the southern migrant theory is correct, which, I mean, hello, feathered serpents on petroglyphs at Chaco, the Mesoamerican ball game all the way at Wupatki, for goodness sake, Macaws. But in the summer of 2008, 
to fulfill my archaeological fieldwork component of my archaeology degree, I spent a couple weeks in the Belizean jungle on the border of Mexico on a dig. On that dig, we uncovered signs of elite living in big stone houses that sat in the middle of modern-day Mennonite cow pastures. The local, but not indigenous people, were Mennonites. Uh, they'd left the states in the mid-20th century to look for a place more untouched by the then ever-growing and rapidly expanding modern world. They would find it, however briefly, in this remote corner of Belize, where they used stones from these Maya ruins as doorstops and bookends in their German-style homes. I do have to say quickly about my time in Belize, the dig was fantastic. I found potsherds with monkeys and amazing Maya designs. We found tiled floors that we carefully cleaned off. And we even found a large circular rock that guarded the entry for this important and wealthy family's personal shibalba, or Maya underworld. In this small man-made cave were two skeletal remains. A couple, most likely the original couple who had begun the small dynasty that we were now excavating. So we took turns going down into the little cave to brush the bones off and then carefully wrap them in tin foil before putting them into a giant bucket, which I have no idea where they ended up, unfortunately, but that's a lot of archaeology, to be honest. But in that little cave, I got to sweat profusely in the small cramped space, uh, in the summer jungle humidity, as we delicately uncovered the bones with a little brush and, and the jewelry that were buried next to them and, and around them. They were next to their limbs or sometimes in between their ribs because they were wearing it and then, you know, then they, they decayed and they died. And okay, well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm avoiding something I don't want to really talk about. But yeah, I did. I broke, uh, I broke one of the guy's leg. I broke the guy's leg. It was an accident. Um, when I was descending the little small wooden log with hand and footholds chipped into it, I, uh, was told by my Maya friend down there who was helping us, who lived there. He was like, all right, step down. And I did. And I stepped right on the guy's uh, leg and I broke it. I broke a, th a thousand year old leg. Um, the Maya guy said it was okay. Cause he break bones all the time. Um, two days later I did get malaria and I almost died. I have no idea if those two things are related. Uh, the Mennonites actually saved my life because, thankfully, a faction of them had liberalized in the 70s, uh, which is when they started growing a bunch of weed and shipping it to Mexico, where it was then sent off to the U.S. So the Mennonites had modern medicine, which saved my bacon. It was also strange to see, like, Amish-looking young men, like white boys in the... Maya jungle riding in horse and buggies with iPods in their pockets with the big old white cords leading up to their ears. Other times they'd be doing wheelies on their dirt bikes in front of the place where we were staying to impress like the college girls. The Americas are really just one big land of migration. So, I've seen the rain gods and the feathered serpents of Tlaloc and Quetzalcoatl. I've held in my hands potsherds I plucked from the dark Yucatan soil that showed monkeys holding up the ceiling of the vessel, surrounded by the geometric shapes that also appear in the southwest. The two cultures do seem somewhat inseparable, yet distinct. Childs agrees, or I guess I agree with Childs, when he says, quote, Mixed in with unique Mexican images on Pacime pottery are the same designs I saw etched into a floor stone at Mesa Verde in Colorado. The same geometric icons painted on cliffs around Hovenweep in Utah and inscribed into the cap rock of Antelope Mesa in northern Arizona. The southwest, including northern Mexico, appears to have once contained a single cultural identity marked with regional variations that were in turn connected to Mesoamerica along the chain of the Sierra Madre. There was a continuous line of people whose most powerful gods dwelled in springs, clouds, and water-filled mountains. End quote. Childs goes on to suggest this cultural identity that bound the Americas is water, and I tend to agree with him. 
I mean, these people traveled extensively all over the continents, and they would have noticed the end of the Ice Age and the drying up of the many enormous lakes and the glaciers and rivers becoming smaller over the thousands of years since the end of the Ice Age. But the exact cultural glue that bound the Americans together from Central and North and even South America isn't as important as the fact that it exists or existed. Like the rest of the settlements graced by the Anasazi, around 1450, Pakime is destroyed and abandoned, and unburied bodies are left thrown about the landscape within and around the once powerful Pueblo. Each and every home and room within the homes within the Pueblo of Pakime were destroyed or burned. Here is another long quote from Craig Childs. The fall of Pakime occurred just as major settlements were abandoned across most of the southwest and the intricate cultural systems of Salado and Hohokam fall apart. This did not happen all at once. Migrants traveling south in the 13th and 14th centuries had brought a boom to the lower southwest. Too many people moved too quickly into what was once a landscape of dispersed settlements turning them into urban centers as people massed around pueblos and large villages wherever there was water. Then came a century of complex demographic upheaval between 1350 and 1450. Resources diminished, and the health of the people deteriorated. Populations declined and retreated to a few core areas, and soon many of those areas were empty. At least 40,000 people living in parts of southern New Mexico and southern Arizona simply vanished from the archaeological record. Pakime, a bastion of growth and art at its height, died in the face of this dramatically unsettled environment. It was the last great collapse in the prehistoric southwest. After many centuries of occupation, the city was soon buried by wind and dust. Only a small portion of its 15th century climax was now exposed. Beige, geometric walls crossing in and out of one another in warm spring sunlight. I looked across the ruins toward the Sierra Madre in the distance, thinking, when the cities burn, you go to the mountains. You climb back into the earth, into places dark with water. End quote. So, let's follow Childs and the Anasazi Salado spiral migrants from the north. Let's follow them all, down south, even further into the mountains of northwestern Mexico, where this story will end, like the center of that ubiquitous southwestern symbol. At this point in Child's book, House of Rain, he tells an incredible story filled with Spanish dialogue from a smoky bar in the mountains of northern Mexico, the mountains of the Sierra Madre. And there he learns of incredible ruins even deeper in the canyons and mountains that very few see and even fewer discuss. I implore everyone to read the fantastic book instead of listening to me talk uh, and read longer and longer quotes from it. But uh, after that smoky bar, he and his then wife and two archaeology students travel even deeper into the mountains and meet with a rancher who, in hermit Spanish, which was barely understood by the four Americans, but this hermit um, rancher agrees to show the ruins that the Mexican rancher has no time for. He calls the place with the ruins and the bones, human bones, un malo lugar, quote, este lleno de fantasmas, end quote, a bad place filled with ghosts. This place they travel to in these Mexican mountains a stone's throw from the isolated Arizona mountains, but this place is at the end of a 900-mile-long range that starts just north of Mexico City. It goes from jungle to desert, and at this northern end, the canyons and cliffs are filled with ruins. More ruins than you can shake a stick at. There's coils of finely woven cotton ropes, which may suggest that the Anasazi up north had them as well. If these people are Anasazi, that is, which by now, I mean, if, if you're still listening, then you also believe with me. I hope that they are. And then there's corn. Tons of cobs everywhere. 
and more than that, T-shaped doors of every single persuasion, size, and shape that can be imagined decorate more doorways than even before in a pueblo anywhere up north or at Paquime. And these pueblos here in the northern Mexican mountains reach three stories. A lot of it is seemingly unique, unless you follow the lines of evolution and that spiral migration, not to mention the timeline. The whole area appears to child as an echo of the north. I haven't been there, obviously, so I can't back that up, but I believe him. I mean, it's an echo, a distant on the other bank of the pond ripple, but one caused by that initial drop of stone into the water that was the Anasazi migration. Ripple on the water or spiral, whatever it is, this place in the northern Mexican mountains mirrors the Anasazi Salado migrants, which by now we can't even call Anasazi Salado migrants because now they're mixed with Pakime and the southerners. Who knows what they are now? But the place mirrors the Anasazi, especially its pottery. There are, of course, slight variations and evolutions and changes, but the pottery checks out. And the dates match at around the 1400s. It's almost too clean and concise to ignore. And then there are these circular rooms complete with the structures and features necessary for them to possibly be kivas. If kivas exist in this place, then I feel like there is no argument to be made about who built these ruins in the northern mountains of Mexico that border the American Southwest. And at this point, we might as well just call it the greater American Southwest. But with so little evidence and only a few sources to rely on, I personally have no idea. Like I said in the last episode, though, I am not a scientist or a professor or a keeper of great secret knowledge. I am only a repeater and interpreter of that awesome knowledge. So I have no skin in the game except to make these stories more accessible and enjoyable and entertaining for you. But to really get a feel for the story and history and facts, you should read the sources I list if you're interested. You should read the words of those who have traveled so much more extensively than I have. Read about the travels of those much harder and heartier and stronger than myself. Reading Childs and Roberts and about their adventures makes me realize how soft I really am. To some, like my family and friends who I tell my stories to, they comment on how crazy or stupid or fun, but I could never do that, the stories I, I tell are. Yet, there are so much better adventurers out there than I am. And thank goodness for that. The Anasazi spiral migrants, it turns out, only briefly ended up in those northern Mexico mountains, in the Sierra Madre. Because they didn't stop there, they continued to spread southward, ever onward, ever forward, into the spiral. Or at least down that line of Aztec, Chaco, and Paquime. Well, not all of them. Much like with the Hopi in Arizona who stayed behind and fired the pottery and became the Hopi. But much like them, a group of people who still call the Sierra Madres home today, stayed behind in those deep mountain canyons and on those steep mountain slopes. Some sources I read called these people descendants of the Mogollon. Some said Membres. Another said they're Pakime descendants. All are correct. But a few sources I read just outright claim these people are descendants of the Anasazi. Even using that word, the Anasazi. There was no mincing words for some researchers and writers. Both Childs and Roberts suggested as well. When first reading about these people who stay behind, I recognized their name from college. Not because I learned about them in school. In Norman, Oklahoma, uh, there was, and still is, a Mexican restaurant named after this group of people. And back in college, the, the name of the restaurant got me curious. So I did some minimal research way back when. And what I discovered was that this group of people were known for running down deer with knives. They didn't need ranged weapons because they chased their prey on foot until it gave up or died and dinner was served. 
If it weren't for the delicious restaurant in South Central Oklahoma, I may not have ever heard of these awesome and awe-inspiring people until now. I'm talking about the indigenous Mexican or Native American tribe of the Tarahumara, or as the Spanish called them, the Tarahumara. They call themselves though, and which the Spanish could not pronounce, but they call themselves the Raramuri. And the reason why the Spanish couldn't pronounce their name is because they couldn't ask them properly how to pronounce it. Every time the explorers or missionaries or conquistadors would approach them, the Taramara would run away up into the hills. Their name, Raramuri, roughly translates to people of light feet or lightning-footed people, which that name alone seems to suggest their Anasazi origins. That ancient theme of migration and the six toes and the constant movement across the land and the spiral it's all represented with the Rama Murray by what they call themselves, which leads me to believe maybe the Anasazi named themselves something about movement. And the Rama Murray really can back up that name. They are famous for running over 200 miles in one stretch, and they've been called the best runners in the whole world. Not only the best, but the most beautiful runners. In a piece titled Secrets of the Taramara by Christopher McDougall, a piece that is absolutely fun and fantastic, well, the author describes an intense and grueling, very difficult 100-mile ultra-marathon called the Leadville Trail that takes place very high up in the Colorado Rockies. This particular race he writes about uh, in 2018, is when he writes it, took place in 1993. Here is the quote. Once the starting gun sounded, around 4 a.m., a sea of taller heads quickly swallowed the Tarahumara runners, who faded into the middle of the pack behind the world's most scientifically trained ultra runners. As the sun rose, though, and the course began climbing toward the 12,640-foot peak at Hope Pass, the Tarahumara began easing forward, running so beautifully that one Leadville veteran was left mesmerized. They seemed to move with the ground, Henry Dupree would later tell the New York Times, kind of like a cloud or a fog moving across the mountains, end quote. For that particular race, the winner was 55-year-old Victoriano Churro, who, back at home in the Copper Canyon region of the Sierra Madres, was a farmer. He was also the oldest of the three chain-smoking, I kid you not, oldest of the three chain-smoking, homemade, discarded rubber tire, sandal-wearing, Rara Murray runners in that ultra-tough ultra-marathon. In second place was another Rara Murray, and in fifth was the final man from the Sierra Madres. The following year, another Tarahumara man would win the Leadville Trail Race with an even shorter time. That article is awesome and was very fun to read because it really dives into the details of how amazing the Rara Murray are at running. It also goes heavily into something the Rara Murray call the Rara Hipari, which is an important game that the Rara Murray play from childhood until well into their 80s or longer. Now, you should definitely read the article. Today, there are only about 40,000 Taramara left, and they're some of the most remote people on the entire planet. And with every new encroachment of people or civilization or violence, they retreat deeper into the mountains. Although, like with everyone everywhere, well, except for that tribe that throws spears at, at people, who the researchers who land, that's hardcore, but just like with everyone, the 21st century is threatening their traditional ways of extremely good health and extremely low rates of domestic violence, child abuse, and even crime. And that's despite their economy predominantly being one based on trading things for beer. One writer quipped that for every two days the Robert Murray spend on their feet running, they spend one on the ground drunk. And of course, their Anasazi ancestors would probably be proud because the beer they love to drink is made of fermented corn. The Rama Murray weren't always in the rocky canyons and steep slopes of the Sierra Madre, but after the Anasazi went further south on their Chaco Meridian, 
they stayed at the foot of the mountains, farming in small rancheria pueblito communities. That is, at least until the Spanish arrived. At which point, they did what they do best and ran into the protective canyons and cliff faces. A move their Anasazi ancestors of the Colorado Plateau knew all too well. Unfortunately, the cartels and Mexican soldiers and government and lumber companies, and even worse, roads, grocery stores, chocolate, and Coca-Cola. It's all further encroaching on their land and way of life. But I hope and pray they don't lose it forever. The article I quoted from is from a larger book by the author called Born to Run, which I will be reading now. But Born to Run? We're all born to run since we're all human. It's kind of one of the things that makes us human. It's just that the Raramuri focus their culture on it. Practically their entire way of life is focused on running, and they never lose their ability to chase a ball and each other up and over and down the very rugged and remote and steep mountains and canyons of their homeland. Just like the other groups of Anasazi descendants who decided to stay put as the larger group migrated south in search of their center place, the Raramuri of today are much different than the Anasazi would have been around 600 years ago. The Raramuri are known for being largely nonviolent and for having no real tribal leader, which is not quite the case for the Anasazi. Now, of course, most of, if not an overwhelming majority, of the Anasazi people would have probably been a peaceful and nonviolent group, like every society. But we know from all of these episodes, and we will hear about even in the next episode when I talk about the ancestral Puebloans and their rejection of hierarchy and violence to a degree. But as we know, the Anasazi practiced warfare, slavery, sacrificed, and cannibalism. And they would continue to do so as they headed south. So let's pick up their trail. And I promise it's coming to an end. A few hundred miles south of the ruins in the mountains that Childs explored, near the Taramara homeland, but a, a few hundred miles south of that, identical ruins in cliffs and canyons exist. So this story has now reached beyond science or archaeology and like a spiral itself, it has entered a smaller and smaller event until that event disappears into the ether, like the center of an etched or painted spiral disappears into the rock in the southwest. And at this metaphorical spiral center lies the historical end of the Mesoamericans. Fifty years after Paquimé is burned in the 1450s, and the further south Pueblos appear, something happens in the Americas. It's discovered by the old world again. Here's a great and my final quote from Childs about what the Spanish saw at the end of this spiral. On their journeys, Spanish scribes and generals reported endless indigenous settlements in northern Mexico. Adobe pueblos and houses terraced all across the landscape. They wrote of encountering native communities with well-planned streets running between buildings. An attention to detail that impressed even these foreigners who had already waged war in the great southern city-states of the Aztecs and the Maya. The Spanish conquistadors found elaborate markets in northwest Mexico. Slaves being bought and sold, exotic goods arriving from extensive trade networks. In the late 16th century, the Spanish explorer Baltazar de Obregón mentioned traveling from town to town and from province to province, telling of large cultural centers surrounded by satellite villages laid out with surprising and strategic regularity across the country. One expedition moved for eight months through this region and every two or three days came upon yet another central town that had never before witnessed a European face. This land appeared to be widely populated with a highly ordered civilization. Early journals of Spanish travelers in northern Mexico relate their discovery of indigenous priesthoods and ceremonies of a celestial religion. There were native leaders with great wealth and power, their arms and chests draped with turquoise. Their palanquins hoisted on the bare shoulders of young men. Of course, conflict started quickly between natives and the Spanish. Upon key hills and peaks, fire signals were said to have erupted, sending word of war for hundreds of miles in all directions. And the battles that ensued 
the Spanish were met with standing armies, thousands of fighters, perhaps as many as 10,000 in one reported confrontation, gathered against them to pounding of drums, the ringing calls of shell trumpets. The musket ball was fired in return, singing swiftly through the air, naming the end of an era. End quote. David Roberts in Lost World of the Old Ones expands upon what I've been talking about when he says, quote, The wildest surmise in Lexan's book is tucked away in a five-page appendix. There, the author slyly notes that when the first conquistadors pushed north from central Mexico into present-day Sinaloa in the 1530s, they found a massive, flourishing Indian civilization at a site they called Culiacan. Guess what? Culiacan is awfully close to 107 degrees, 57 minutes west. With the demise of Pacume around AD 1450, could the same visionary migrants have carried their civilization another 400 miles straight south, across the towering ridges of the Sierra Madre and the plunging chasms of Copper Canyon, to found the last of four great centers on the meridian? End quote. In that state of Sinaloa, the same state as the Las Labradas site with the spiral-etched black lava rocks that pour into the Pacific Ocean, which is extremely close to the end of that Chaco Meridian line, in the state of Sinaloa after the year 1500, there were two groups the Spanish ran into that put up quite the fight. The two groups are very similar uh, in their language, which was an uto aztecan language just like the Anasazi. But the two groups are almost identical in language, lifestyles, and culture, despite them being sworn enemies. Almost like the truce between the segregated Salado factions that broke on the Mogollon Rim, or with the Anasazi Civil War in the Four Corners, or with the segregated groups at Pakime. These almost identical but sworn enemy groups are named the Akashis and the Shishimes. When the Spanish arrived, they ran right smack into the fearsome and fierce people of the Akashis. The Akashis way of life should sound pretty familiar to you by now. They were a people who lived in the mountains and canyons of the Sierra Madres. A people who cultivated... Beans, squash, and of course, corn, but also cotton. They were a people who lived in fixed settlements scattered over several miles that the Spanish called rancherias. They played the Mesoamerican ball game. They had ritual warfare, and they practiced cannibalism. And their cannibalism rumors that the Spanish told the crown weren't just made-up scary stories. Modern researchers have discovered both pot-polishing and defleshing marks on human bones from the Akashi region. And we know from the last episode what those clues on the human record mean. Mancorn. Meanwhile, the Akashi's near-identical but sworn enemy, the Shishimes, were remarked upon by the Spanish as being seemingly quote-unquote civilized, with their stone buildings and their farming techniques. Both groups have been recorded as being the only, quote-unquote, warlike group of indigenous peoples in this part of Mexico. That's maybe because they're not from that part of Mexico. Or at least, they hadn't been there for a long time. The Shishimez, too, practiced the art of mancorn. And actually, there was one other tribe in the area that did as well. The Tepehuan. And the Tepewan are another near-identical group to the other two. But they were even deeper into the mountains than uh, their neighboring cousins, the Shishimes and Akashis. But the Tepewan also farmed, spoke a very similar, near-identical language. They warred, and they had cannibalism. In 1529, Nuno Beltran de Guzman, an infamously hated man in Mexico, it turns out, But Guzman set out westward from Mexico City with three to four hundred conquistadors and up to around 8,000 native allies. And he was searching for those seven cities of Cibola. And he was there to bring to heal the many tribes and groups and civilizations that hadn't yet fallen under Spanish control because of what both Childs and Roberts talked about, the Spanish running into groups of tens of thousands. In 
So Guzman was there to find gold and civilize the tribes. But, unfortunately, his campaign was harsh and has been deemed genocidal. But it ended with him establishing the city of Culiacan, a city where many more missionaries, fortune hunters, and soldiers would leave from later, including Esteban, the first black man in the New World. I mentioned him in my episode about black explorers in the Southwest. I believe the very first one. He may have been the first person I talked about. He's the very first black to have ever been in the Southwest. He'd leave Culiacan shortly after its founding and go up north looking for those seven cities of Cibla, only to be killed by the Zuni. But before the establishment of Culiacan, Guzman and the other Spanish warriors and their allies would find what Akashi and Shishime's soldiers had survived, the many, many epidemics, and defeat them. And then they would place them under control of the Spanish. Very few peoples in the Americas really escaped the control of their European colonizers. The Tarahumara being an exception. And that's it. That's really all of the information I have on these three so very, very Anasazi-sounding groups. That's all I have for you. So, are the warlike, Udo-Aztecan, stone masonry building, corn, beans, and squash planting, Mesoamerican ball game playing, and they were the only ones in the entire region playing the ball game. None of the other tribes on the coast or in the mountains around them were playing the ball game. But were the warlike, Udo Aztec and speaking, stone using, corn planting, man corn indulging, Akashi, Shishimez, and Tepehuan tribes, the much changed and far off journeying end of the spiral Anasazi migrants? In that email response from the awesome Steve Lexon, he said to me, quote, If there's a southern end of the meridian, it's probably Culiacan. Not sure how much I got into that in study of southwestern archaeology, but there's some pretty interesting early Spanish accounts that suggest if you headed straight north from Culiacan, you'll find cities. Casas Grandes Chaco. Not functioning cities, but still. End quote. Like Waldo said about them archaeologists, I have no idea. I'm just guessing. Next time, I'll be covering the ancestral Puebloans from the Hopi Mesas to the Rio Grande Pueblos of Santa Fe and even beyond. I'll be covering them from after the Civil War and the Great Migration. Um, I'll also talk about the evolution of their Kachina culture. And in two episodes, I will finally be covering the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. That revolt would not only change the course of the American Southwest, but of the Great Plains, and many eastern tribes as well. But before we go, and speaking of the Pueblo Revolt, something very similar happened with the possible remainder of the Anasazi nearly 80 years before the events of the American Southwest. In 1602, the captured and diseased, decimated and downtrodden Akashi Indians of the Sierra Madre, that may or may not be the final iteration of the Anasazi, well, the Akashi led what would later be known as the Akashi Rebellion. In 1601, an Akashi leader named Perico would use Indian and Christian religious practices to promise his followers that the Spanish would be exterminated if they followed him into the ultimately doomed rebellion. In the first week of the attacks, 50 Spaniards were killed, Spanish mining camps and 40 Spanish churches were burned and Spanish silver mining was blocked in the area for two years as the Akashi took up strong positions in the mountains. Of course, in the end, they were defeated. Perico was publicly executed along with 48 other leaders, and many of the people were sold into slavery. The Jesuits then appointed their own leaders, attempted to educate their people, and stole the children. In 1610, the Shishimes, after asking for help in their upcoming rebellion, but being denied that help by their Akashi sworn enemies, they began raiding and killing the Akashi people. And the Akashi, having nowhere else to turn, asked for help from the Spanish, who came and squashed the rebellion. Then, in 1616, the two teams did finally get together, this time in the Tepehuan Revolt. <laughs> 
that third group of possible Anasazi descendants. The Tepewan revolt was called by one Spaniard at the time, quote, one of the greatest outbreaks of disorder, upheaval, and destruction that had been seen in New Spain since the conquest, end quote. That revolt proved a lot harder to suppress, but ultimately, after four years and a lot of loss of life for both sides, it was ended. There may be less than 30,000 Tepewan, Shishimez, and Akashi Indians left in Mexico today. So, besides the Taramara and the Hopi and the ancestral Puebloans and the Tohono O'odham, along with, no doubt, quite a few more I didn't discuss, that's probably your answer for where the Anasazi are today. <laughs> 